Katia Kina, Mikia Tata, Fari Nay, Fari Fari Maka, or Philippine Gold. Oh, here no Kainui Tata, Kikatsu, I have a fine Nay or Tata. We find the Matsu and Naira Mako, we will see a cafe fire and see Nay Tiaku in Naira. We find the Matsu and Umay, the Kaha, Kitapaka Tutsu, keep fighting Nama here, Terangi Nay, and I got Tutsu Pimo, Mata, I keep paying Nay, the Mahire Ata, or Philippine Gold. What they may find the Matsu, Akina Tsu. Ita koro matu a kiri kiri ro, nei ngā mema poti e noko tahi nei, ita piri piri i ngā kore ro a tēnā a tēnā ko a hara mai tēnā e rā. No rei rei e pae te matu a ki a tau ingo mai, o mana ki tanga tato ki rumi a māta i roto i tēnā nei pari i tēnā e rā nei, i roto i te mua tapu o tau tana i kaiti. Amen. Morning everybody. On my drive to work recently I passed a roundabout upon which were hard at work the parks and gardens staff of the council. So this reading is a kind of a tribute to them, but also a note to council that you may need to raise your budget a little. <laughs> <laughs> Comes from the prophet Ezekiel. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Carnelian, chrysolite and moonstone, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald, and worked in gold were your settings and your engravings. Thank you. Thank you, Mona and Bishop Hallinan. Uh, I'll open today's meeting, which is Thursday the 18th of May, 2017. Uh, this is a Council Annual Plan Submissions meeting, and um, it is 9.35. So today's meeting is about the hearing of the annual plan and consequentially it is my view that it is appropriate that the Chair of Regulatory and Hearings Committee, Councillor Ange, chairs this meeting. The Deputy Mayor supports me on this and I would therefore move a motion that the Council approve Councillor Angela assuming the chair for the 18th of May 2017 council meeting, noting that the purpose of today's meeting is annual plans hearing. So that's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Gallagher, uh, Cap Deputy Mayor Gall Callender. So all those for, any against? That's carried. Thank you, Councillor Ange. Gadgets going. Good morning, everyone. Just to find my mento. Okay. Um, thank you, Mayor Andrew. Um, right. We'll move to. I'll oh, just welcome to uh, committee members, uh, Mayor Andrew, media members of the public, um, and to our online viewers as well. Uh, we have some apologies from Councillor Pascoe, Councillor Young, who is away sick, and also Councillor. McPherson, who may not be able to attend today, and uh, we want it noted in the minutes he is attending a Ministry of Health consultation on suicide prevention, and so for personal reasons feels that he needs to be there. Uh, any councillors that aren't in attendance today are still able to participate in deliberations in the debate, which will be on the 1st of June, um, and those councillors that are away will obviously read today's report and go through the submissions as well. So with that, I will move that the apologies be received. Can I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Bunting. All those in favour? There any against? That's carried. Okay, confirmation of the agenda. Nothing's changing for the agenda today, so I'll move that the agenda be received. Seconded by Councillor Tooman. All those in favour? There any against? That's carried. Any declarations of interest? Uh, I do have to just register that my mother put in a submission. I try and keep her out of politics, but she doesn't listen to me. <laughs> you know, she's much more of a political beast than I am, um, but that's not really a conflict. <laughs> so there are no declarations of interest, so uh, we'll move on to item five. Now, today, councillors, as Mayor Andrew pointed out, we are here to listen 
today to uh, members of the public on our annual plan. I just wanted to go quickly through the process of how we're going to do that. So we have a list that was emailed to you last night of speakers. We've had quite a few drop off. We did originally have about 53 speakers and now we've got just over 20. So we'll work through those shortly. Um, so the first part of the proceedings today is to, to, for us to listen. Please, I uh, respectfully ask that elected members don't ask questions to uh, make political points and uh, or ask questions or get into debate with the submitters. We're here to listen to them. This is their time to speak to us and our, uh, our time to make political points and get into the substantive discussion is on the 1st of June. It is important we follow that process properly. Um, we have advertised that this is public hearings process only. However, at the end of uh, today, and we should be finished well before lunch, uh, staff will all come up to the seat so that, like we've done other hearings, if you've had, if anything uh, perks your interest that you want included in the deliberations report to come back for the 1st of June, just write it down and you can um, chuck it on the list for staff. Also, we do have to accept the analysis report and we will do that and I, and I can take questions on this, but again, it's really just on the information in here, not on the substantive discussion because as I said, we can't get into deliberations or debate, debate today. So is that clear? Are there any questions just on that process? Um, all the submissions just for members of the public are online, so if you see an elected member like myself who can't get into her computer, uh, on our computers, all of the submissions, there's 499 of them, are on our electronic devices. So some members use their phones for that, some use laptops and others use iPads. All right, so uh, with that we will start, and I'm using two devices, so I'll do my best here. Um, just a minute. I think we have Rod Bowman up first. Now, this is submission number 43, um, and councillors, the uh, submitters have five minutes to speak. The bell will go at four minutes, and we'll have some time for, for questions. Councillor Bunting? Uh, is, yeah. am, I, am I right with that? Uh, my electronic list here says Rob Bowman, so oh. he may have arrived before Nancy. No dramas. Each submitter hasn't been given a specific time. They were, they were given a group schedule, uh, a time slot to, to come in. Okay, so let's go. So submission number 43. Good morning, Rod. You're very familiar with our process, so I'll leave it up to you. Good morning, uh, Madam uh, Chair, Your Worship, councillors. Um, I'm here to speak this morning uh, in regards the free parking uh, plan, which was, um, I believe, submitted by Councillor Taylor. Um, and this, to me, is just Councillor Taylor attempting to make good on an election promise. Uh, what annoys me considerably is that Councillor Taylor does not live in Hamilton. So, so Rod, sorry, can I just stop yeah, you sure. here? Um, the council signed off. We, we, as you know, we make decisions yes. by majority, so um, you need to refrain from pointing this at one particular councillor because it was signed off by the majority. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, firstly, the question that needs to be asked, I believe, is, is this a targeted rate or a fixed rate? <clears throat> On our um, rates invoice assessment, we have access Hamilton, and then we have a fixed rate for the Hamilton Gardens. And there seems to be quite a bit of confusion at the moment, even ringing council staff, on whether this is going to be incorporated into access Hamilton or whether it's going to be a actual targeted fixed rate. Um, the way I see it is that if this is calculated in access Hamilton, then it will incur capital value increases and then the 3.8% uh, yearly increase, so it will be more than 26.57 cents uh, year on year, because if the rate factor increases, so will this. I'd like that question answered later on, uh, if I may. Um, the flaws in this policy are more than self-evident in the whole idea. 
Firstly, this type of free parking was tried at at least four New Zealand cities and it failed in every one, Rotorua and New Plymouth being two of them. Secondly, people from outside of Hamilton who do not pay Hamilton City rates will also have free parking in this little scheme and at the Hamilton ratepayers' expense. Thirdly, it is stated it will be only for 10 years. This again is according to Councillor Taylor in the, in the press, which means by any stretch of the imagination, it could well be infinitum. Fourthly, the CBD businesses will only be paying 10% of the 1.4 million shortfall, whereas the residential ratepayers are footing 90% of this shortfall. The businesses are the people that have already seen the benevolent hand of council with their rates being lowered and will see further reductions in the coming years, of which the residential ratepayers have already picked up the tab. Five, into the 1.4 million shortfall are included the fines, I believe, which they will still be continuing under the new scheme of things, therefore another bonus for council. Number six, not everybody wants to shop in the CBD. Many want to remain in their own suburbs to shop. And can you blame them with the increase in traffic, especially over the last two years in Hamilton? Also, the CBD is in a cramped place to drive in, not to mention the down and outs, homeless and drugs related individuals still wandering the CBD. Both my wife and I have been accosted on, at several times by these people for money when we come into the CBD, which is quite off-putting. Seven, online shopping, which in this day and age is becoming very popular, which really takes the hassle out of shopping to a larger degree, and in most cases is cheaper, is having an impact on everything, including the CBD. Number eight, and this is very important, the new technology that Councillor Taylor talks about in the press about which will aid all of this free parking. Where is all this money coming from for that? There we go again. There's another question for you. What, who is funding this? Is it funded or again is it on somebody's wish list? Again, are you going to rip off all the parking meters and then replace them a week later? Like Councillor Tooman said some time back on the silver screen. Um, you will also see no visible outcome, I believe, in free parking, only further costs for Hamilton City Council and paying for the individual ratepayer, especially those on fixed incomes and the elderly pensioners. This money will really affect them, as I say, on fixed incomes. Lastly, and more importantly, it is already a viable user pays system, which will become free parking, becoming a ratepayer funded parking system. This then is the Hamilton ratepayer and there's no other word for it. We are being continually screwed by Hamilton City Council. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Rod. Um, I'm just trying, well, there are questions coming. I'm just trying to get my screen to work. So we'll go to Councillor Bunting for questions. Uh, Angela, I was just wondering, um, Rod asked a series of questions. Um, is it okay to answer those in an apolitical way? No, you don't answer, answer um, don't the submitter's questions. questions. Okay, That's right for on. deliberation and All debate. Right. Are you aware that um, the technology that uh, you quote Councillor Taylor is putting uh, in the press it, it was accounted for in previous annual plans that have no. already been budgeted? No. For? Okay. Cool. That was I anything that is uh, accounted for in previous this annual plans, of course, uh, if it's two million or three million, it always becomes four or five million. Mm. Uh, things do go up in price, of course. Of course. So you never meet actual budget. Right. Okay, that's all right. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Rod. Thank you for your submission. Thank you. Amy, why is my screen not working? Oh, <laughs> okay, thank you. Excuse me, Madam uh, Chair. When I ask about the whether this actual targeted rate was going to be fixed yes. or in uh, Access Hamilton, um, what would be the answer to that? Yeah, we, we, uh, look, we are 
not this is not really the time for that, but just very quickly. Um, yeah, we need to have to come back to that. You okay. Um, all right. Yeah. Yeah. And and all of those things will come around through the debate and substantive discussion as well. Thank and you. We're recording uh, questions from people as we go through so that we can Great. actually follow up. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. Okay, um, next submitter up is Nancy Kajer, and the submission is number 33. Good morning, Nancy. You're Good also morning. very familiar with our process. Good morning, everyone. Um, okay, so the first question I want to talk about is the uh, question of equitability. With a user pay system, it's a clear, simple system, you use, you pay. Once you get into a targeted rate system, then there's a question of who actually does the paying. There are some people who pay no rates, there are some people who pay subsidized rates, there are some people who pay rates on more than one house. And so council then becomes a judge and jury as to who does the subsidizing and who gets the subsidy. And it certainly isn't an equitable system. Um, the 1.4 million figure that has been uh, spoken about as the loss of revenue seems to me to cover the trial period of October 2017 to uh, April 2018. So that's a six months period. So do I infer from this that the uh, loss of revenue for a whole year will be 2.8 million, which means that the rate increase per household is not $26, but actually $52? Um, the next question, the next issue I want to talk about is uh, about the retailers saying that the free parking is likely to increase sales. Rod already mentioned about four cities that have trialed it and that yes, it has not succeeded. And um, if councillors believe that it will increase sales, or if retailers believe so, what evidence do they have to support this motion? Um, and also, if retailers feel that their business will benefit from this, then it is to them that the full cost of the parking should go on. This is a cost of business. It will obviously be passed on to consumers to increase pricing because ultimately nothing is free. If you're comparing free parking in Chartwell and the base, then you're actually comparing apples with oranges because most likely retailers in Chartwell or the base are already paying for the parking through the, the uh, rent they pay to the companies owing, uh, owning those, uh, those businesses. So uh, certainly to put them on an equal footing with the CBD, then the CBD businesses need to uh, step up to the plate in full. Secondly, I, uh, thirdly, the question of the CBD vision. The CBD has changed in nature, especially after uh, the consent was given for the development of the base. It is no longer a destination shopping area. There are better alternatives as well, elsewhere. And free parking is definitely not going to change this. The solution calls for more collaboration between businesses, developers, and council to think outside the square. How do you help retailers in the CBD? Um, I believe the, question, the solution is to be have more foot traffic rather than people driving into the city to, uh, to go shopping. Um, better planning, uh, attracting more businesses into the CBD larger employers. What's happening at the ex-farmers building is a very good outcome. Are there more of such projects in the pipeline? Um, is there a move to attract more government department from Wellington to Hamilton? After all, we are less earthquake prone than, than Wellington. Um, so these create employees in the city and they are the ones during the lunch hour will be the ones that the retailers should be targeting their business towards. The retailers also need to change their modus operandi. No longer should they be thinking about opening their hours from nine to five. They should be catering to the workers who are there, open later and stay later. 11 to 7 p.m. say. This encourages people to stay longer, shop after, rush hour, shop after work instead of getting caught in the rush hour traffic at 5 o'clock. A lot of cafes in the city close around 3 o'clock, so if I want to come into the city for a 3 o'clock meeting, there's nowhere to, to have a drink. I think um, Councillor uh, Southgate will, and I once had a meeting and we couldn't find a cafe that could uh, accommodate us. So um, it's really thinking outside the square and thinking about how businesses can work to, um, to get foot traffic into the CBD. The next issue is on housing. Um, I know this is already on, on, the, on the table. Councillors um, 
So developers have been, been encouraged to have infill housing either within the CBD fringe or um, on the northern end of the CBD. Again, having people living within uh, walking uh, distance of the CBD will generate the food traffic and demand for shops to cater for their needs. So what do people really want? Parking fee at a dollar, two dollars an hour is not the real issue. People who say they want free parking really want a longer time to park and being able to park near the place they're going to and they would prefer the traffic warden to be less zealous. If you make parking free in car park buildings, will they still come? I surmise that they won't. They'll still say the CBD is dead. They probably can't be bothered to walk a block or two to their destination and they will use the homeless in garden place as an excuse. So I'll end by saying that keep the parking as it is, but extend the stay time from two to three hours. Keep the free parking zones the before nine and after three. Remove parking charges on Saturday. Saturday used to be free, but now, you know, we have to pay for parking on Saturdays. And the weekends are the time where people actually come shopping and, and go in, come into the CBD. Have evenings and weekend events that could draw in the crowd. Make more angle rather than parallel parking and find a solution to CBD workers so that they're not using all the parking spaces, maybe a, ride, a park and ride scheme. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Nancy. We'll go to questions now. Councillor Southgate. Good morning. Am I on? Oh, thank you. Good morning. Um, morning. Uh, you've raised a couple of points, and I'm interested in, um, you've, you've suggested a number of ways in which the central city might uh, become revitalised. How do you see this proposal as it was set out for annual plan fitting in with the CBD revitalisation plan or do you, f do you not feel there's a fit? That's what one question. I also wanted to, to um, extend your commentary around um, park and ride proposals and interconnection with passenger transport. If you have any views on that, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, certainly I think um, transportation is, is key to having cars off the street and the need to park. I mean, I would gladly use the bus to go to the CBD if the bus system was more frequent. I don't use the buses because they're infrequent and uh, the, the, the spoke system of every bus having to go into the depot doesn't quite work for a lot of people like me who are very busy and have to go from one destination to another. Um, I can't go into the city out to the next place, back in and out again. So a revitalization of transport system would certainly make life a lot easier and would actually encourage people to get out of the cars and onto public transport and I, I like to see that happening. I grew up in Singapore and I go visit back very often and I always use public transport when I'm in Singapore. I use the buses, I use the trains and it works a treat um, and taxis are reasonably priced so I never use a car there. I always encourage everyone there to, to forget about having a car and, and that, that should be the same with uh, every major city in the world have a good transport system and if we want to get out into that grade of a good major city, we really need to think about our transport system. The park and ride scheme, I, I think that you know, we've got the ability to get workers to park their cars outside the CBD and then have a, a shuttle into it so that they will take they will not use um, some of the parking spaces that are already there because they park the whole day, which already means that um, people who come in for a short time into the city cannot really use the parking space. Um, in terms of revitalization, I think what's happening in the city is actually very exciting. I think we've got some good developers with uh, funky ideas, and uh, I like the fact that old uh, buildings are being revitalized and given new life, what's happening around the the old uh, supermarket um, at the corner of, uh, yep, just behind Kmart, that's, that's great. I see, I drove past and see what's happening at the farmer's building, that's, that's absolutely fantastic. And I know Kmart's being revitalized as well. So there's a lot of revitalization that's coming in that's bringing more people to work in the city. But if you work to nine to five and the shops are also open nine to five, it's just really pointless. When I lived in England, I worked in London and I always shop during lunch hour. I don't go into London specifically to shop, but during the times I'm working there, I would go and, or I'll stay back after work if there's a shop there. And, and that's the same, you know, you just want to encourage the people who are there to stay there a bit longer. And if you've got cafes that are open a little bit longer, 
you know, why rush with the traffic? Why try to get over the bridge at five o'clock with the whole um, humanity when you can just have a linger and have a, uh, a drink and, and, and drive back at leisure? So, uh, you know, I, I certainly like to see the revitalization because my heart is in this city and, and certainly I think, um, you know, we, we are on the right track, but a lot more can be done. Okay, uh, Councillor Mallet. Thanks, Nancy, for your uh, submission. Um, Nancy, are you aware that we have a regional policy statement which places the central city, uh, Hamilton CBD, at the pinnacle of our retailing commercial activity? Uh, no, I'm not aware of that, but I, as I said in my submission, you know, um, perhaps that need to be changed. I think... Okay, that, so, so, yeah. so thank you. So, yeah. you, you, so do you, I was going to say that now, so do you think that aligns with reality? No, it definitely doesn't. Because the CBD is no longer the destination shopping area. Okay. You know, I mean, we need to wake up to the fact that the base has now grown to become the unstoppable giant. And um, it, it's a horrible place to go, but a lot of people go there. <laughs> and uh, good luck because to them. Because it's horrible? Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so I, and, you, and I, you touched on the Singapore situation. Yes. Now, I just wonder, is it appropriate to um, contrast for Singapore, which is extremely dense? I mean, you've got, you'll know better than I, but you must be five million people live in yep. Singapore, is it? Mm, yes. We've got, we've got 160,000. Mm. Um, probably over the same, I don't know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if our footprint's as big as Singapore. Well, you know, Singapore never... So, I, so, so I guess my yeah. point is, um, is it an appropriate... Um, uh, Example to say in Singapore, it, with public transport walks because works because we've got five million people in a very small space. In Hamilton, we've got 170 people in a in a, in a city that's going that way rather than. And I, I don't think Singapore Singapore's can't go too much further. Or are you going to the yeah, sea? Yeah, no. Don't you? Um, the point I was trying to make really is that public transport is key because. Singapore have suburbs as well, right? So I would say each of the suburb would be like Hamilton. So for example, if I were to go to Topayo, which is a, a suburb the size of, say, Hamilton, mm. there's a good public transport system there because there's interfeeder services that people can use to take them to the train station, which then connects them to the CBD. So um, I guess Singapore is New Zealand because we've got the same size population, but within Singapore there are different areas which is equivalent to Hamilton. But, but the point is Singapore is that big, New Zealand in toto is that big, New Zealand's twice, you know, uh, way bigger than Singapore in space, Singapore's way bigger than, Ham uh, than uh, certainly Hamilton and in fact New Zealand in population density. And true, population true. Density. I, 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 totally, I totally agree that, that we do have a population density uh, situation which may not justify some of the costs, but, you know, it's a chicken and egg situation. Where do you start? Do you say we don't have the population, therefore we don't provide the services? Or do you say we are going to get the population, let's provide the services? And, and the thing is that if you have a bus system that only runs once or twice a day, who's going to use it? It's the same like, mm. you know, this proposal for a train line between Hamilton in Auckland, if I have one train a day, who's going to okay. use the but, service? But Nancy, we're talking a, a, a magnitude. We're talking 170,000 people versus, I don't, I don't know what the number is in Singapore. Is, is 5 million close? So, yeah. so yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. So we're talking, but we it's, need it's a to, magnitude of difference. It's not. We, need to, we are running you know, well over time yeah. okay. with, this, um, with these questions here, and we need to keep a little bit more Thank focus you. to the actual proposal. Um, so, can I go to Deputy Mayor? Oh. No? Yes, uh, no, no, just very briefly, anything you can do through the various hats you wear to encourage central government to follow the shining light of the DHB in terms of, you know, <laughs> locating significant operations in the CBD would be very appreciated. Thank you for that okay. comment. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Councillor Taylor. Nancy, thanks for your submission. Thank you. Um, I noticed in there that you, you mentioned that... Um, OK, sh please, let Councillor that, that you That the before nine and after three parking, you are happy for that to stay? Mm. Yes. OK. Are you aware that um, that actually amounted in a loss of revenue to more than $800,000 this year to the Council, which mm. in effect ratepayers have had to subsidise? Okay, no, no, I'm not aware of that. But if that was the case, then put back the parking. As I said, the $1... $2 an hour is not an issue. It's the time. It's just that when you, when you have to go into the city and you have a meeting, you want to be able to do something after. So if I come in for an hour's meeting and I'm parked for an hour, 
then chances are if the meeting overruns, you know, I'm looking at my watch thinking I better go and get my parking sorted out, and then I can't hang around after. So, you know, the, the money part is not the issue. I don't think people quibble about paying a dollar, two dollars an hour, because the time, if you go out to Auckland and pay six dollars for half an hour's parking on the street, you know, you realize how cheap parking is in Hamilton. Um, but since you've introduced it and it's successful, then why not stay with it? Stay with what, sorry? With the, with the pre-9 pre past 3, three okay. o'clock. So even though that's costing $800,000, you're happy with that? Well, but you're not I happy with $1.4 million no, for no, two hours? No, no, um, I, I retract that. I will, I will clarify that again. If you have already provided that service and costed it as part of the rates and it's successful and you're happy with the costing, stay with it. But if you don't want to be, if you're not happy with the costing, then put back the parking. It's no, it's no issue to me whether that is paid or free parking. But what I'm saying is that because it seems to be successful and you seem to have already provided for the 800,000 in your budget without going to rate payers and talking about a targeted rate, then um, perhaps that's already been costed. So okay. it's okay if we don't ask you about it? Uh, okay, no. okay that, that's enough. That's not that. what I said. No, no, so yeah. we've gone well over time with, yeah. um, with this, this um, submission. So thank you very much, Nancy, for coming to talk to us My today. My pleasure. Right, so our next um, submitter is Rissell Knapp, and this is submission number 248. Welcome, Rissell, you're also familiar with our process. Good morning, Madam Chair and Councillors, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, better get the glasses, because I'm blind. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, today I'm sure you'll be hearing lots from people about the inequity of a targeted rate and what I think is the patronising foolishness of calling it free parking. So I'm not going to do that. I want to address the cause of the failure of the CBD. Trying to solve a problem by having ratepayers pick up the tab is about as sensible as applying a band-aid to an accident victim's cut finger when the patient is hemorrhaging internally and is about to kick the proverbial bucket. The real problem is the partially operative District 10 year plan. Unfortunately for retailers, it is working exactly as intended. So how does this affect parking? Firstly, it's about a particular brand of sustainability and the belief that the Hamilton should become an increasingly compact city. In other words, a CBD should be full of high-rise apartments to bring vibrancy to the CBD. Unfortunately, Hamilton citizens are not flocking in to live among the vagrants and nighttime party, party goers, sorry, and therefore not providing the foot traffic this plan needs to succeed. Small to medium businesses are hemorrhaging and inner city retailers are giving up and leaving. In the last month, my two favourite shoe shops and a surf shop my kids love are closing. There's now no longer a reason to bring me in town. I can do everything else in, in the suburbs. And the time it took to develop the draft plan and for it to become the partially operated plan, planners have been busy beavering away to make coming into town in one's car a nightmare with parks disappearing, bollards being erected, simple left-hand turns at impossible angles, i.e. Victoria into Ward Street, angle parking at parking at angles so acute you can't turn into them from the opposite side of the road, as in Caro Street, shared space with pedestrians often not realising they're potentially in the path of a car, footpaths have been widened and roads narrowed, Pedestrians crossing widened and car parks removed to accommodate the extra width. I could go on and on. Planners have done a brilliant job of discouraging motorists, which is exactly what the plan set out to do. The operative plan states again and again and again and again. It's all about Hamilton being a pedestrian-oriented, bike-friendly city. I quote from the partially operative plan. 7.2.5 objective, a pedestrian oriented CBD. 7.2.5 C, traffic and transport corridors are managed to enhance passenger transport connectivity, prioritise safety and convenience for pedestrians and cyclists. And, listen to this, encourage the removal of unnecessary traffic from the central city. I'll repeat that 
encourage the removal of unnecessary traffic from within the central city. Well, they've certainly achieved that. Note the jargon. Who knew that a simple road was now a transport corridor? That passenger transport connectivity means buses, and the safety and convenience of cyclists and pedestrians means that the safety and convenience of motorists is of little concern. So now we have a dead CBD, and here is where the proposal of free parking runs into trouble. Council can sim not simply override the plan or operate against the intent of the plan. The district 10-year plan is a legal document and council, that council is required to produce every 10 years. It has cost the city six point million in total, including consultations, hearing, commissioners, consultants, legal advice and printing. That does not include the blowout of staff and thousands of hours of staff time. 1.9 million was spent on hearings, including consultants, legal advice, venue, catering, hearing administration, and this excludes the payments to appointed commissioners. The two independent RMA qualified commissioners were paid $774,202. This plan has now morphed into the partially operated district plan and now has full effect on all matters Ex with the exception of those matters in relation to the Ruakura plan change. It is now having, f has full effect and is legally binding. Council has no mandate to work against the intent of the plan and encourage cars back into the city when the very intent is to, is to, that has been removed by the Environment Court is to remove them. Any changes to the partially operated district plan are required by law to proceed through a statutory process under the Resource Management Act 1991. To summarise, if council decide to proceed with free parking and increase traffic density in the CBD, they are flouting their own operative plan, which I believe is outside the law. The plan has legal status. It has gone through a very lengthy and expensive process and council can't subvert the essence of the plan which she's unnecessary cars driven from the city in favour of pedestrian cycles and buses. The ideology of the plan has turned out to be a giant fail and we have a dead CBD. But like it or not, I believe we're stuck with this parking status quo. Um, are you winding up now? Yes, I'm winding up. I've got some few more bits here. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I hope that with future district plans, council won't take a hands-off approach and will actively be involved in it. Um, I think we need to understand that apartment living is not something that Kiwis aspire to in general, and it's exactly the lifestyle that immigrants flock here to escape. Cars are part of the Kiwi psyche, and shoppers will continue to avoid the CBD, where it is a driving nightmare. And I think parking is the least of our problems. Thank you, Rochelle. I'll go to Councillor Mallet. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, so it, is it your contention that the um, cent, cent, central city parking proposals actually breach your are uh, against our district plan. Yeah, it goes against, goes against the intent of it. I have yet to find anyone that's actually read very much of it, but it is, it is the, in, the intent of the plan is to get rid of cars and make it a pedestrian, cycling friendly city. Um, and it says quite clearly it wants to get rid of excessive cars. It's been heard by RMA commissioners. It's now enshrined in law. Thank you. So you're saying the um, uh, pl uh, parking plan contravenes our district plan? I believe so, yes. And secondly, you also, I think, um, teasing out what you're saying, you're suggesting the central city district is almost um, unfit, not fit for purpose in terms of attracting... Because the whole reason for, my understanding is the whole reason for the, the parking plan was to try and revitalise the CBD. Very um, laudable process. Oh, absolutely. But, but you're suggesting perhaps that the horse is bolted on that in terms of... Oh, I think of, so. Um, I think it, it talks initially about, it said the whole um, drive of the plan was about the primacy of the central city, mm. which is admirable. But the further you get into it, um, the whole thing hinges on 
becoming, and everything that comes out of council talks about it becoming an increasingly compact city, which is jargon for high rise. Mm. Um, it hasn't happened. Um, and I don't think it will happen. I don't think, as I said, I don't think it's part, it's not something Kiwis want to do, live in apartments. It's not, it's not part of who we are. I mean, if people get desperate enough, I suppose, and there's no housing, but it will only be a, a very temporary solution for people. But I think, I think they've killed the city. I think, particularly for CBD, older people. CBD, you mean, when you say city, you mean CBD? The CBD, the, the CBD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Particularly older people, it's a nightmare driving in town. You know, I, I came through the shared space one day and there was an African family lined up in front of me having their photos taken. They had no idea they were in the middle of a shared road. It also, it, what I think is happening is that pedestrians are becoming increasingly blasé because and, and the, the times people just simply step out in front of you is unbelievable. It's, mm. um, I just find the whole thing a hassle. Why would I come to town anymore? The two reasons I came were two shops and they've gone. Okay. Thanks, Rochelle. Thank you, Councillor Mills. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one more question, Rochelle, oh, from Councillor Bunting. Uh, oh, no, it's okay. It's no, fine. okay, great. Thanks very much, Rochelle, for um, speaking. Oh, sorry, Mary Andrew needs one. Do oh, you, sorry. Do you understand your African family on the shared way head right away over your car? I do. Thank you. I do, but it's, it's, it, okay. it's, quite, it's kind of frightening. It's frightening because, you know, older drivers like me, this... It, you know, we, we didn't expect people to step out on pedestrian crossings, or at, and, and a lot of them aren't real crossings, but people do that now. They just look at you and assume that you'll, you will stop. And um, I guess for older drivers, you know, reactions aren't as quick as they might have been. Thank you. So it's a bit of an issue. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Right, our next submission up is Frankie Letford, and this is submission number 78 in our documents. Um, good morning, Frankie. Welcome. The bell will go at four minutes, but as you can see, we are running a little bit over time, so we'll have questions after that. Um, you, might, you might ask, why am I here? Um, well, I've watched the ebb and flow of traffic and things happening in Hamilton since I parked in Garden Place many, many years ago. And I have travelled a lot, and I've noticed what works in cities and um, my, I want my, my submission to be maybe more positive, um, coming up with ideas. I think that the reason for the lack of shoppers in the CBD is not due to parking problem, problems, but a lack of interesting shopping. There is no ambiance for the leisure shopper. The council must spend the money it will save on free parking on improving the leisure shopping experience. Free parking is available, as we know. I th um, I'm only in town to buy something, as are most shoppers. What I don't do is linger for leisure shopping because this is missing. The CBD shopping area is not one where you can stroll from cute shop to cute shop and stop for a coffee in a nice cafe. What we need is people with imagination using the money we save and don't waste on free parking to work with downtown and centre place area to open up to the adjoining sheet. Streets. There are too many walls facing our shopping streets in that area. There should be seating in the sun, flower displays in front of shops, nicely sited for the weather. Make it welcoming. That area is possibly coming back to new dress shops, I see. Reward those shops with good street ambiance, and it's really ugly now. Make sure that we have verandas for protection and for outside cafes. I hope that that new building on the corner of Ward and Victoria doesn't continue to replicate that silly veranda on Victoria and Bryce that doesn't even keep the rain off. Memento Corner shows how a veranda can make a difference. I remember when verandas were in the city district plan. Are they still? We need them for high street shopping in our variable weather. Improve the streetscapes. Morrinsville and Te Aumutu have done it. The cowscape has become a tourist attraction. The roads have been made pretty. We have neglected upgrading the CBD and lost shops. To bring back shops, we have to spend and use the example set by other cities, soften and improve the streetscapes. Employ a young ambassador to advertise, have shopping happenings, encourage interesting shops. There needs to be a plan to cluster shops near Centre Place, Barton, and open up Bry Street to start, then eventually Ward and Worley. As other cities have done, the city should buy some buildings in the area with the money that they get from parking, maybe in income with um, 
private enterprise as well. We often do partnerships and this could work. Um, and we've got some great developers in, New in Hamilton and develop them, enabling a range of small, affordable food, art and boutique spaces. Once they survive there, their foot traffic brings more shops to the area. Havelock North, have you been there? A wonderful lot of these, no chain stores. Have you seen the old bus stop in Thames? It's a happening building with a range of small, intimate food, design, gift boutiques and excellent cafe. Busy. Little Thames can do it, why can't we? Christchurch has had to do it. Britomart has been transformed. K Road has St Kevin's Arcade. Hastings CBD is growing. Employ town planners who love shopping with funding and with experience in successful transformation. They can improve the leisure activity of shopping. We've proven in Ward and Worley that cars and parking don't bring in shoppers. My other point is aim for the wealthy, let the base cap cater for, pres for bargain counters. What we need is the woman who, who lunch. We want people with money who are wanting that boutique shopping. Listen to Generation Zero. They understand what a city should be. Give the workers a nice place to stroll in their lunchtime. The quality of cafes is boring, franchise trains. There are ripped seat covers in both the centre place ones. There are cute cafes with interesting food in other parts. Bring them in. We spend to get a hotel. Why not improve the city in the CBD? If you hate shopping, then listen to those who like shopping as a leisure activity. I also submit that Garden Place should remain as it is, a place for citizens to gather, the centre of our city. Squares, piazza, plaza are traditionally in cultured areas of the world, a place for the city to breathe. Too much money has been spent on Garden Place. I agree with Generation Zero, we need a space for people and Garden Place being right by our city civic buildings is where we should have a square for city citizens gathering. Bring back gelatos, I say. <laughs> when people in the south want to shop, they go to the CBD. And as Peacock develops, this will happen more. Also, the Waipa and Waikato counties are madly subdivising in the southern city boundary. The traffic on Morrinsville and Halpo Road has become impossible in the morning. Those are not ratepayers, but they may be our shoppers if we provide an interesting shopping destination. Forget about the northerners, concentrate on the south. They are the natural CBD shoppers. For them, popular Cambridge is owned 15 minutes away, offering up a nice upmarket leisure high street shopping experience. Diabolical parking doesn't stop them. Let's do it better before we waste more money on the wrong problem. Don't waste money on free parking. Parking isn't the problem. We have plenty. Quality shopping is lacking and shoppers with money are keeping it in their pockets or going elsewhere. Thank you, Frankie. We'll go to questions now. Councillor Mallett. Thanks, Thanks Frankie. Um, in your submission, Frankie, you talked about um, town planners and et cetera, and we need, need to employ some. You realise all of, basically everything that's been done here has come from the, um, the, the, the great innovation and in, in, uh, imagination of our town planners. Uh, my, my suggestion is to get ones that love shopping. So get good town planners <laughs> instead of the ones we've got now. Well, well, it's just it's just a different way of looking at things, isn't it? You know, often I'm yeah. in a group with my woman friends, and and they say they won't go to the base because it's horrible. They'll rush into town, they'll buy what they want, and they'll go home. What we want is what you do in Hastings, mm. Havelock North, is where you meet your friends in town, have lunch, you wander from shop to shop, and your money comes out of your pocket. You know, at the moment we don't have that. Frankie, why do you think a huge number of people do go to the base? For money, because it's cheap. Oh, because it's cheaper? I don't it's go to the base. I don't want to buy mm. cheap stuff. Okay. And neither do my friends. Yeah. So um, whether, it's not, it's, whether it's you or your friends, there's an awful lot of people go out to the base, so we need to... And that's that, good. That, that's providing a service. OK. That's right. good. But, okay. but we want to... My point is to mm. improve the CBD, and, and I think, you know, if you listen to people who want cheap stuff, stuff, they're not ever going to come to the CBD. They don't want to pay for parking, and and you know there's no cheap shops here. Well, it's cheap food, but there's no cheap shops. You know, Barton Street, two hundred, three hundred dollars for a dress. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You know. I'm, you Thank you, Councillor. Um, we'll go to Councillor Henry. Thank you so much, Frankie. Um, I totally agree with you. I, um, I'm just carrying on from what Councillor Mallard said. Who would you like to see on on? Is there 
do you think we could set up a panel with people like you that have an influence on on the town planners? Because I, I'm not sure about the town planners, whether they're all just male and they don't shop. You know, that well, might this, be the this, problem. This I'm sorry to say that they're hunters. They go in and, you know, grab and come out again. Well, if, I, if, and my, 90%, hus if 90%, my husband goes so. to... To shop, he comes home in five minutes. Yeah, you know, yeah that's right. Well, I go to when I go to <laughs> shop, you know, I quite like to wander around yeah. and have a bit of a look at this, a bit of a look at yeah. that. And I think shoppers, the workers that are going to come to farmers and places, they're going to want to come and, and wander. And uh, we used to do that. We used to do that. Hamilton was the Golden Mile. I had a person who worked at Modern Bags on the corner of um, Collingwood and Victoria, and they said that was the biggest foot pack traffic for them in New Zealand. It's gone, but it, we can bring it back, I'm yeah. sure, if the shopping's good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Frankie, I just have one question, and then I'll go to Councillor Bunting. Just on that, um, you'd be aware that, see, and I see, you know, you've referenced a lot of smaller towns in New Zealand, but also, um, you know, I think it's well known by most people that CBDs around the world are, have all either gone through this, um, period because of big box retail or are going through it. Uh, do you think that it will ever change? That I mean, you mentioned that the CBD isn't destination shopping anymore and we're seeing that change happen. Do you think it will ever go back to that? Well, I think, you know, my, my idea is start small and the, the city has to um, make the effort to put a bit of money into it you know, improve the tr streetscape, go into partnership with um, someone and just have these little, you know, there's no delicatessen in Hamilton. There's no, okay. you know, there's, okay. a, there's, a, there's big gaps, big, big gaps. And the cafes are awful. You know, the, the one gather in um, Frankton, which is out there, you know, it's, it's wonderful. There are some lovely cafes in the central city. Well, there are some. <laughs> I, we not, all visit not, them but frequently. Not, but not, not in Centre Place and not in downtown. <laughs> OK, thanks, Frankie. Um, last question from Councillor Bunting. Thank, Thank you. you. And just before we go, um, hi, I'm male and I like to shop. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, look, I, I take your point on board and, and I, I, I share your vision. Um, you know, I, I've travelled as well and it's, uh, we've all thought, wouldn't it be great? Um, I'm wondering, because as, as you've seen, the process is that retailers go where retailers, where the market is. Um, and you've identified that we would love to have dallies and we'd love to have that, but that I guess there's only a certain amount the council can do and there's only a certain amount that we can plan for. What cities in your mind or do you, would you like to see Hamilton resemble? Well, at the moment, the CBD is um, the centre of a... The base is the big place, OK? Yeah. So we have to see Hamilton as a village, like okay. Cambridge, like ha ha um, Havelock North, because it, otherwise, you know, Havelock North is twice the size of Hamilton um, shopping centre. Mm, mm. Um, so, you know, what we have to do is start small, and as we start small, more and more um, shops will come there. Um, so but you have, to, you have to start small, and right. at the moment, shops will say, no, I'm not going to come in there because... It's too expensive. There's no foot, and that's where the city has to. So, are there any cities around the world that we could use as an example that you particularly like? <laughs> Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> See, Barcelona. thank you. Okay, thank you very much um, for coming to talk Plus to Robin. your submission today. Right, our next submitter on my list is Patricia Gregory. And uh, elected members, this is submission number three oh seven. Good morning. Um, you are familiar with our process as well, and the bell will go at ding it four minutes, and if you can wrap it up and then we'll go to questions, that'll be lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. I don't think I'll be five minutes. I'm very brief. Um, I just want to say, when parking meters are bringing in such a large income that each rate payer will have to pay $26 to make up for the council's loss, why take away such a lucrative income? If parking is made free for two hours, council will still need wardens to have the spaces policed, or it'll be taken, of, taken advantage of very quickly. The annual plan says quite clearly that businesses are the ones who will benefit from free parking. I don't think it is fair that ratepayers should have to subsidise businesses. 
the only fair method for parking in the CBD is user pays. There are free shuttles from downtown car parking buildings, so no one has an excuse for needing to park for two hours in the CBD, and certainly not for free. And if one is going to be in town for two hours, then they should park in a parking building, not take up what should essentially be short-term parking for, say, nipping in to pay a bill or the like. For those who rarely, if ever, go into the CBD, and that can be for many reasons, for example, those who don't drive or are unable through disability, etc., then it is simply unfair and undemocratic that they should have to subsidise parking for those who don't want to park in one of the many parking buildings in town. I'm aware that cash is being used less and less nowadays and that, and that is no doubt one of the reasons for removing the parking meters, but I do not believe it is a good enough reason for them to be taken away when they bring in such good income. It is unreasonable to say the least that the loss of income caused by removal of the meters should be shouldered by ratepayers. The breakdown of businesses paying 10% of the council's loss of income and the ratepayer having to pay 90% of the loss is totally unfair. I've spoken to several people about this, asking for their views, and basically what I've said above incorporates much of what has been said to me. I've even read this submission to several people as well and each person was adamant that they did not want another $26 added to their rates for car parking in the CBD. If we didn't have so many parking buildings in town, the situation could possibly be different. But we do have plenty, and anyone who is coming to town for a couple of hours should not be able to take up free parking to save having to pay in a parking building or having to walk a short way from a parking building to get to where they want to go. After all, Hamilton's CBD is not exactly miles wide. So I reiterate, the only, the only fair way for ratepayers is user pays. They should not have to subsidize businesses. And I do have one last thought, and that is if the council goes ahead anyway and removes the meters, ignoring what I am sure the majority of ratepayers want, then two hours free parking is far too much, in my opinion. It should be 30 minutes max. Thank you very much, Patricia. We'll go to Councillor Bunting for questions. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate your submission. Thank you. Um, you say the only fair way is user pays. So with that in mind, should we make the before nine and after three user pays as well? Because that's already subsidised free parking. Um, I think that it could, those hours could be extended. Okay. Say so eight to six. Eight to six. Mm. Bring back paying yeah. in those meters. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's my only Thank question. You. I just have one quick question because you mentioned um, uh, the parking meters. Would you support would you, uh, uh, us spending money on improving technology, which, whichever way the proposal goes? Well, as long as it's not going to be $26 on the no. rate pay, rates. No. Um, I, the whole point of my submission, I've I've actually been quite sick this year, so I haven't been able to study the plan much. But so many people, you know, know my background, have said to me, $26 on our rates, it's too okay. much. So my reason for appearing today is on behalf of people who cannot afford mm -hmm. another $26 so, on their rates. So if there was no uh, extra In targeted rate or yeah, an increase sure. on your bill, you would still I would. be supportive of us improving technology and moving away from parking meters? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you for Thank talking you. to us today. Right, our next uh, submitter up is Bill McMaster, and he's from the Re Waikato Regional Council. This is submission number 441. Good morning, Bill. You know the process fairly well, I would think. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. uh, Your Worship and Councillors, and uh, thank you very much on behalf of Waikato Regional Council to uh, allow us to present our submission today. Uh, my name's Bill McMaster. I'm the team leader of transport planning at the Regional Council. And 
and I've got Vincent Quo, who is our, uh, one of our senior policy advisors with, with me. Uh, I'd like to pass on the apologies of Councillor Russ Remington, the Chair of our Public Transport Committee. Thank you. Who's uh, unavailable. And Councillor Bob Simcock, who's the Chair of our Strategy and Policy Committee, both uh, were unable to join us today. Thank you. Uh, what, what we thought we'd do is just uh, ex take the submission as read uh, and uh, just pass on some key messages. When the submission was lodged, uh, it had to go forward as a staff submission bef before it went to council. Now, our Transport Policy and, and Strategy Committee met on Tuesday and uh, confirmed the submission and after some discussion had a few key points that they wished us to raise today for, for your council. Uh, and just at a, at a high level, Council wishes to confirm the high level support for the proposal uh, and that support is for op option one of the uh, two hour free parking between the hours of 8am and 8pm. Uh, <clears throat> it, with our public transport hat on, we, we recognise that there's uh, a link between uh, public transport, car use and parking and from that respect, we believe that any impacts that introducing the, the free parking can, can most likely be mitigated through the work that we're doing with Hamilton City Council through the Access Hamilton strategy review, the review of the Regional Public Transport Plan and the Regional Land Transport Plan. So uh, we believe that by working closely together, uh, the impact of, of parking changes will be able to be taken into account. Uh, another point that we would make is that uh, we believe it's important to monitor and evaluate the impacts of the uh, changes and I think that is intended within the uh, review that you're intending just to check that uh, the changes to the parking policy are achieving the outcomes that you're seeking uh, with, with the proposal. Uh, <coughs> the the rest of the submission contains some, uh, perhaps some more detail, but Madam Chair, we're happy to probably leave it at that and take any questions of any of the councillors. Thank, Thank you, you very much, um, Bill. And there are several questions, but we'll start with Councillor Mallett. Thank you, Bill. You talked about the link between public transport, car use and parking. Could you just expand on those links? Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor. The, I guess any, any measures that make uh, it easier for private vehicles to, to travel into CBD can potentially have an impact on public transport patronage. And so that is, from our perspective, it's, it's hard to accurately determine what that impact might be. But uh, the, uh, there is some, and, and it depends on how the parking scheme is, is set up. So just going uh, back to that link or, or that, that, that cause and effect thing, what mm -hmm. are you concerned about? Just be, be explicit that you, what you, you said patronage and public transport, what do you mean? Certainly. Well, it's, there, there are many factors that impact on public transport patronage and it, it's very difficult to determine the exact measure that the parking policy has on that. That's why we're suggesting that if we... So you're concerned we, that people might um, choose to take their car into town because if, if this works, parking becomes more available and it's more convenient for people to use cars and hence uh, uh, the limitations of, a, of public transport would become more apparent and people would not use the um, uh, public transport. I think we're, we're supporting the proposal as it stands because we believe that uh, the way it's set up potentially will have minimal effect, and that's that's the view of our council, that we are supportive of the proposal. And I think the fact that... So can I just uh, ask, if you, you think it will have minimal effect, so you don't mm. think it'll have much effect at all? Well, we believe that the way it's set up with the two hours, and then the, uh, after the two hours, you've got to move your car off street. So I think that is going to prevent the all-day parking type scenario of people coming and people who are working into town that would have otherwise taken the bus. So I think uh, that the proposal should not impact on that. Uh, the, as I say, the, the exact nature of the impact on, on the public transport uh, patronage is a difficult thing to quantify and that's why we're suggesting that the monitoring and evaluation of parking trends 
will be very important to take into account. I mean, transport and whatnot is obviously your, your thing. Uh, are you aware of what, what has happened in other examples where these, these things have done around the city, around the country? Uh, at, a, at a general level. Uh, just at a general just level? At a general level, yes. The, uh, I think this, uh, the, the biggest impact uh, of, on public transport is free all-day parking. And I think, uh, the, I think the intention of this proposal to revitalise the CBD by, through the Central City Transformation Plan, uh, there will be positive impacts. And so at this stage... It's positive impacts on CBD or on bus On management? CBD. Oh, OK. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Southgate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Vincent Bell. Good to see you. Um, I, you partially answered some of my questions, but I just want to explore a little bit of the, of the softening that occurred from the original submission to the um, supplementary paper that we received today. Because I noticed, but I think I've understood it. I just want to check I did. I noticed in your original submission that you are quite firm on the cap on time, the two hours. And then you, didn't, you do say that you don't think it would be a long-term solution for the city, that you're not um, supporting free parking long-term in the city. That's what it said originally. Um, and then um, you've softened that a little bit in terms of the benefits, that you, the potential benefits that you see for the CBD. Is that because your council was weighing up... Um, not only transport, but the RPS in terms of its hierarchy for potential CBD benefits, or where, where did that thinking come from? Yes, I, I think that that's a fair point, uh, Councillor. The the uh, the RPS and the uh, the role of the CBD is uh, would have been a factor that our council would have taken into account. Uh, I think uh, council did not discuss in depth the matter of the. Uh, proposal being a short-term measure but so we believe that point still stands as a as mm. part of our submission that and, and I think that is also supported through the council report that accompanied the proposal that this would not be a long-term measure that this would be a perhaps a two to three year measure okay. uh, to help bring that uh, vibrancy back into the CBD and then it would probably be reviewed so yeah. I think that point of our submission will still stand because you're talking uh, about a more long-term design, as this, because I think the sentence says, as the city grows, continues to grow in demand for, limit, for limited space, because it becomes more acute, and that's what does happen when cities become bigger, isn't it? So you're talking about this as a sort of a, if um, some kind of free parking proposal was to go ahead now, it is only for the purpose of revitalising the CBD, and in the end, it's going to outgrow itself anyway, and you're going to have to need longer-term solutions. That would be our view, that it would be a, a two to three year measure. Two to three. And it, two to three. Um, just one further question, if I might, Madam Chair, and that's really, I just want to flesh out to your thinking, because you've got great experience in this regard, around the connection with the PT. I understood you said it wouldn't have a, um, a significant impact on PT in the short term, which I understand. And looking a little bit further ahead, um, what what opportunities are there with this proposal or with a different proposal to increase the connections with passenger transport? And in particular, I'm interested in the C C CBD mm. shuttle and or its connection with park and ride for because there are two types of people mm. parking. The, um, and I'd like to comment on this. There's, there's short-term <coughs> shoppers, which you talk, you do mention in your CD, the, uh, C in your submission, sorry. You mention the um, short-term visitors and shoppers. Um, not a lot of mention on what you do with the workers, although you did in your verbal commentary. So those three parts. How does it fit with PT? Do you have any comment around the free shuttle and how that might support or um, in the impact of that on this proposal? And how do we deal with the commuters versus, um, versus those people who come into the city to work, of who, which we are trying to attract into the city? So... Uh, yes, yeah, so just addressing those points, I think uh, looking at the, the, the first point about the, uh, I think the CBD shuttle uh, and its role, 
Uh, when the CPD shuttle was first introduced, uh, the intention at that point was that it, the Knox Street car park would be the, the park, park and ride, and then the, the free shuttle bus would take people to the northern part of town or where people were working. Uh, now that, uh, I think, has been a, a, a good move. Uh, and the link with this parking proposal to the CBD shuttle, uh, council, uh, and working with Hamilton City Council through the review of the PT plan, is, is currently looking at the fair options across all of the city PT network. And uh, the central city uh, shuttle service will be coming under review in terms of, is that still a valid uh, proposal that the CBD shuttle continues uh, in its current form. So we'll be looking at that as part of the fair review. Uh, and Is that happening now, sorry, Bill? Sort of yes, in the yes. Next so that, of month? this yeah. will be over the next few months. We'll be working with the committee, looking at the fares in Hamilton and how they're structured and I, I guess that ongoing role of the CBD shuttle being a free bus service. So uh, that, will con that will be on the agenda. Uh, Back to perhaps your third point again about how the commuters, uh, how this will affect the commuters. Uh, I think this proposal will affect, as I read it, the, the short term, potentially the shoppers coming into town rather than the commuter, people coming into town to work. So I think... Uh, so it won't be part of the solution for people working in the city, but people visiting and shopping and experiencing the city. Is that what you're suggesting? That's correct. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Right, thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Councillor Henry. Thank you so much for your submission. Just one quick question. Um, are you aware that this parking proposal failed in other cities? Has failed? Failed, yeah, uh, in other cities. Sorry, Councillor Henry, Two. similar. There. Similar. There's not one. It's not exactly like the same, but similar. There are similar yeah. ones. Uh, no, I'm not aware. Of okay, that, uh, thank you. Point. That is nowhere near how it is. We've never had no, number no. plate and recognition but monitoring of vehicles no, in any CBD in New Zealand's history. No, that's right. Okay. I, I so, so you can't compare the two? No, I was about to say that, so I rule in favour of that point of order. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mayor Andrew. Um, so the Waikato Regional Council is supportive of the two-hour free parking per day, um, who does Waikato Regional Council, I, I see that it was going before your committee on the 16th, and that, I take it, passed? Uh, yes, Your Worship, that, uh, that was supported by Council and reaffirmed, or confirmed. So that's the whole of Waikato Regional Council, that, did they vote unanimously, that, or did they...? Uh, yes, yes, that was a unanimous vote, uh, and that's all of our councillors are, are on that committee. And you've said that there'll be, um, you feel there'll be no impact on passenger transport um, as part of your report? The, uh, I guess just to clarify, Your Worship, the, the impact on public transport is difficult to quantify, and that's why we are suggesting a monitoring and evaluation regime be done to have a look at how the parking policy is implemented. At the same time, we'll be tracking public transport patronage use as well. So. And who does Waikato Regional Council represent? Uh, uh, big pardon. Who, who does Waikato Regional Council represent? In, in terms of the membership? Uh, the well, well, what area does it cover? You're a voice for what people? Oh, oh I guess our, our region covers uh, all of the, the ten local authorities in the region. Uh, the four Hamilton City Council constituency members are part of that of that group, uh, but we do have uh, membership across the whole region from uh, Auckland through to Taupo. And your report is supportive of um, the um, revitalisation of the central city, and you believe that this will help towards that. Yes, we do, Your Worship. We, we submitted on the original transformation plan uh, a little while back uh, supporting the proposals of that plan, and we believe this will help getting more people in. Thank you. To, uh, 
Thank you, Mayor Andrew. Just one question from me, Bill. The current proposal as it stands today doesn't allow for the ability to pay after the two hours. Do the commu committee members have a view on that? Uh, I don't believe that was discussed at no. the meeting on Tuesday. Okay, thank you. Thank All right, you thank you very much for spending the time to talk to us today. Oh, sorry, Councillor Casson. Good morning. Thank you, Bill. Uh, just, just one question. So um, if this parking proposal gets through, and we find that, or uh, regional council find that it does have a detrimental impact on bus patronage. Um, I take it you'll be coming back to council pretty quick to withdraw your support? Uh, well, I, I think through the, the joint public transport committee that we have with Hamilton City, we'll be reporting on a regular basis. So I think any trends that get picked up, we would work with that committee and I guess report back through those members back to council in terms of uh, the output so uh, I, I guess it would be after that two to three years short term measure would be reviewed and if there was a major impact we would have a comment back to the city on that Thank you Thank you Councillor Mayor Andrew So um, in your submission it says Waikato Regional Council is supportive of the proposal to introduce an absolute time limit of two hours of free parking in any one day anywhere in the CBD is absolute time limit, what um, was their feedback from your members about why they had an absolute time limit of two hours? Uh, I think at this Was that the free parking you went? Yes, Your Worship, that, that two hour uh, absolute time limit, I think that probably comes back to the technology that Council is looking at bringing in to ensure that uh, you're preventing people going over their time yep. and, and that was another submission point we made that the enforcement of this needs to be quite strong so that people are not extending their time over that two hours uh, and uh, and I guess with this technology that will also prevent people shifting their car onto another on-street park they will have to go off street so uh, lovely thank you thank you thank you Mayor Andrew thank you very much um, now we are, the committee is going to take a quick tea break till far five past eleven. Thank you.
from Samantha Rose from Sharma, and it's submission number 105. Good morning, Samantha. You have five minutes to speak. The bell will ding at four, and then you need to wrap up so we have time for questions. Thank you. Submission 105, everyone. Great. Thank you very much for having me today. It's very nice to be here. So I wanted to um, start uh, with saying that I think that this parking issue is really just the tip of the iceberg of a whole bunch of other underlying issues that really, for me, uh, should be addressed. It's really starting with the pattern of what are we looking at within uh, community development, local economic development, and uh, the parking has just kind of raised our awareness that you know we've got a lot of issues under the surface that need to be dealt with. Uh, and it's, it's really, for me, not a question of asking about free parking or not free parking. It's how do we support local economic development in such a way that allows for all parts of the city to thrive and not just the CBD, or allows for local um, small businesses to thrive and not just big businesses. So we, for me, it's like saying, yeah, we've got a climate change problem and it's getting hotter. Uh, let's all talk about which air conditioners we should purchase, uh, rather than looking at what do we re really need to do to address the causes of the climate change that we're dealing with. And that's, for me, uh, what, what, what I'm here today to look at. Uh, so, for instance, uh, we've got, you know, the places that we're competing with, the CBD, we've got the base and Chartwell, and you know what are those filled with? Those are filled with quite a bit of chain stores. Who owns them? Where's the money going? Is it really local business? Is the money leaving uh, and going uh, offshore uh, to other investors? And really, that's uh, a key question we need to be asking: is uh, you know what what do we want to support? How can we support local economic development? Uh, there's a great book called I See Red by Judith Bell. She's actually from around here, and she wrote a book about the warehouse because she was um, basically her small business uh, got killed by the warehouse and you know we, we need to look at places like that uh, if we're drawing people in to be supporting companies like that that are killing uh, New Zealand owned businesses uh, then that's not something I want to support at all so we need to look at how we can yeah support our, our values which is local economic development uh, and the last time I came into the city, um, it was actually towards the evening, but it was a heavy traffic congestion. And I think, uh, uh, you know, having, uh, talking about parking, which is about cars, is really not something we should be focusing on. Rather, let's look at uh, public transport options that allow for people to get into the city easier without even having to rely on their car and uh, just really greatly improving the public transport system. There's already a great bus system with the city center having the uh, s transport center, and we just need to look at making it more efficient. Uh, one of the things uh, I, I would like to see is bus racks on the buses so that I could take a bus easier. I live about a kilometer and a half from uh, the bus stop, uh, so that would be great to be able to bike to the bus stop, put my bike uh, on the bus, and then take the bus into town rather than using my car. I would just put my shopping, if I shopped here, in, in my backpack. Uh, so that's another option. And then the other thing which I wanted to do the other day, but I was not able to do it, um, is that I wanted to take a bus into Auckland, and yet there was no, that I could tell, no very inexpensive park and ride areas for me to keep my car for the day uh, so that I could take a bus into Auckland. Uh, I had to then drive my car. So I come from, uh, where well, I was born in Washington, D.C., where there's fairly affordable park and rides outside of the CBD in order for people to be able to affordably uh, get in using the metro system. So something like that could be done for people to get to Auckland until our train system is uh, up and running. Uh, and then I would like to say that, uh, as many people have mentioned about if people want to shop here in the CBD, that they should really just be subsidizing their own shopping trips. Uh, me, I personally think that uh, I would like to support more local people. If I had shops that were around me that I could get all my shopping done, I could walk, ride my bike, see the neighbors while I go do my shopping, uh, that's what I would prefer to do rather than uh, trying to get somewhere farther away. It would be great to see local 
businesses, perhaps we even need to look at zoning to say that can we also have more economic activities where people are living. Um, I used to live in West Africa where there's economic activity all over the place. We don't have zones and CB, you know, there obviously is a CBD, but you know, I was able to do most of my economic activities around where I was living, being able to walk and see people uh, without having to get into my car. So I would really like to see little satellite economic centers rather than just focusing uh, on concentrating on the center, rather looking at decentralization. Uh, and then one last thing, which is there's uh, obviously if, uh, with free parking, you've got enforcement costs, time, money with uh, you know more technology and people monitoring these two hours. To me, it just seems like a silly uh, focus when we, we really need to be looking at this bigger picture of uh, supporting uh, local businesses, supporting other areas of town to thrive. Um, and, and looking at a better uh, transport, public transport system. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Samantha. We've got a question. Can I just clarify, are you speaking on behalf of Sharma? Uh, my work in my personal life is quite uh, often blurred and grayed because I do the work that I love. Uh, so, yeah, always there's going to be overlap. Yeah, I didn't come representing Sharma. Okay, because it's just on, our, on your form and on our hearings sheet that okay. says Sharma, but I just needed to clarify that. So you're really speaking from a personal, personal perspective today. Yes, I, yes, I okay, am. Okay, thank you. We'll go to Councillor Mallet. Thank you very much for your um, submission. Um, you spoke against subsidising car parking, but you understand that the bus service is heavily subsidised also. So is, uh, you're comfortable with subsidies for buses, but not for car parking? Yeah, I think I think there? buses are definitely the way to go. I've also no, had. No, just talk, uh, I'm just talking more about the subsidy oh. side. So, if you're going to attack subsidies for car parking, would you then attack also subsidies for buses? Well, buses. Uh, look how many people you can fit on a bus. It can actually serve a really large number of people, including handicapped people. And my children take the buses all the time. I'm really fortunate that I don't have to be chauffeuring my kids all over the place. I'm really happy to subsidize the bus system. <laughs> But not car parking, even though by a, a huge magnitude more people use cars to get around than um, buses. I think that's a the massive, problem. Massive. I think we need to be encouraging people to not bring their cars so often and, and upgrade the public transport so people don't feel the need to take their car. Do you think people have the right of choice? Oh yeah, absolutely, but people don't have the right of choice if the services don't exist. So you only have choice if the service exists. So if you go to a buffet and you're only offered two things and you know they're both meat and you're a vegetarian, you haven't really got the choice. So you gotta look so at what do you offer. someone should be forced to, to provide you with meat? But, someone what? should be forced to provide you with meat? No, no, no I'm vegetarian? saying, for instance, if Can't I'm a vegetarian be. and I go to a buffet <laughs> and there's only two options and they're both meat, I don't really have a choice. You might say, well, you can choose this one or that one, but it's not really a choice if neither one of them are vegetarian. So that's what I'm saying. Pe we, you know, yes, people do have a choice, but the services have to be there, and, and there needs to be you know, incentives for people to want to take the bus. Uh, you know, and, and like I said, having a bike rack on the bus, I certainly would take the bus more often if I knew I didn't have to walk long distances to get to the, uh, the bus stop. Okay. But uh, clearly, and, uh, you know, by a huge magnitude, most of the citizens of this city don't make the same choice you do. So should they be forced to subsidise the buses or the park and rides? Well, I think if they, you know, we're talking about also in the city. So we're, you know, you're talking about cars in general, and then we're talking about the city. So the bus goes all around the city. You can go all the way from the top to the bottom to the east to the west. So you're you're How's looking. How's that different from a car? Because you were talking about CBD. So we're looking at parking within the CBD, which is like a one kilometer radius, mm. versus, I don't know how big the city is, but it's pretty big, you know, subsidizing something like that. So yeah, I can get from north to south um, <coughs> versus just Excuse subsidizing. Me. And we were talking about shopping, you know, or, or, you know, people being able to do things here versus, you know, you can do so many things. You can go to a park, you know, take your whole family, uh, you know, versus the CBD, which you're looking at people coming in to do, you know, shopping. Okay. Um, and you did what someone else, uh, 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 an earlier submitter did, um, compared uh, Hamilton which is a, on, on a global scale, a tiny city, mm. to a massive city, Washington, D.C., we mm. had Singapore comparison. Um, how valid are those comparisons, do you think? Do you think I think that the park and ride... I guess, I oh, guess the, issue, the yeah. issue is we're talking about 
incredibly dense, where there's a huge number of people in a relatively small space, Singapore, Washington DC, versus Hamilton, which is uh, 150,000 people, and I don't know the, this, but, but it's, a, it's a way, way, way different scale, isn't it? It's a different scale, but the thing that I was talking about is a park and ride to be able to get to Auckland. So I do know that there's an issue with people uh, on that road. You know, there's a safety issue for driving, as well as just the um, you know the clogging up of the the arteries of the roads. So, for instance, if we're going to be talking about subsidizing <coughs> parking uh, or at least offering uh, you know uh, affordable parking, uh, personally, I think that subsidizing uh, something for people to be able to commute to Auckland using public transport until a train system is available. I'd more support that than I would for people to come into the CBD when, you know, as I said, there's bigger economic questions in, in involved with that. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I just have one question for you. Samantha, you mentioned um, in your submission you don't support the proposal for free parking, but then later on in your submission you said that you appreciate the free parking at centre place that's offered. Can you tell me what the difference is for you? Uh, the one hour in centre place, I come for a lot of meetings here, so I just take advantage, and if I have to walk from there, so I know that I don't know who's subsidising that one hour, but um, you know, if I have a meeting that I know is under one hour, I'll take advantage of that. But I've al I also don't mind paying a dollar or two for parking. For me, if I'm working, I take it out of my work. Uh, you know, petty cash, and if it's personal, a dollar or two compared to the price of living, it really, it's, I guess it's piddly. I, thank you, Samantha. I guess my question is, what, why, why is there a difference to you between free parking on street and free parking in a parking building? Like, is there a conscience, is there a particular reason why you would you support one? Uh, well, the one that already exists. The one we're not taught, we, you, the, 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 okay. the center place wasn't put into the annual plan, so I haven't, okay. you know, no, addressed, yeah, it just exists already. All right, so. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Samantha. Right, um, we uh, have Roger Stratford up next, and this committee is uh, submission 132. Good morning, Roger. You're very familiar with our process as well. The bell will go ding, uh, ding minutes. <laughs> the, bell <laughs> the bell will ding at four minutes, and uh, you need to leave some time for questions. So we're in your hands. Good morning. Thank you very much, Chair. The first thing I would like to make quite clear is the CBD is certainly not dead. It's just walking through Garden Place, I can see um, there's hardly there's nobody around. Uh, the few people that are around here are some dishevelled males, and I think isn't that wonderful? Two points I'd like to make: one, the question of equity. Uh, if we're going to have, I, I'm opposing the proposal for free parking. If we're going to promote free parking for people in the suburbs to come to in the city, we also need to subsidise buses for any city, inner city dwellers to go out to the base or to Westfield Chartwell. Second point I'd like to make, it's covered by my submission, is that. In the city, CBD businesses that will be subsidised in their proposed free parking. Now, buskers and curbside beneficiaries um, will, be, will be taking advantage of, of people coming into the city to shop with the free parking. And I accept, I accept that more people will be coming in for the free parking. Now they're not going to be paying. They're not going to be. The, they're not going to be paying for the free parking. They're not going to be charged for the free parking under the annual plan proposal. It's the, the cost is going to be borne, the twenty percent cost or whatever, which would, which would be charged to CBD businesses. They will be um, taking the full brunt of their costs, but the. The buskers and the beggars who will, be, who will be benefiting from more people coming to the city to spend money, they will be benefiting from uh, from the free parking, but they won't have to pay for it f through their through their rates. Um, that's quite clear. That's quite clear, I think. 
Um, and my my point in mind, the um, the buskers and the uh, curbside beneficiaries have every right to be here in the city um, as the C CBD. Um, and I just think that um, yes, that that that. that I've covered most of my other points in, in my in written submission. Thank you, Roger. We'll go to questions now. Councillor Mallett. Thank you, Roger, and congratulations for an outstanding um, analogy, the curbside beneficiaries. I've never, ever heard that before. And <laughs> members of the media, take it down. <laughs> curbside beneficiaries, outstanding. Um, just, you did mention in your um, presentation, Roger, about subsidising buses to take people from the CBD to the um, base? Yes, thank you very much, Councillor Mallet. It costs about, it costs, for inner city dwellers, it will cost $3 to go, to, to travel to the base, for example, on the <coughs> bus, on the bus, which, which, is a, which, is, which is a perfectly, perfectly um, fair price to pay. I'm just suggesting that um, if, if we're going to have free parking in the inner city, which would normally cost, say, $3 for two hours, then for, for the sake of equity, we should, we should also be pr proposing in, in, in an annual plan such as this, um, allowing, giving, subsidising um, trips, bus trips to the base or to the Westfield Charter from so, inner city dwellers who, who live in the inner city who don't need free parking because they can just walk to the city. So, so if I'm right, what, what we could be doing, which is um, quite unique, what you're suggesting, I think, is um, people could come and park for free in town, get on a subsidised bus to go to the base. Is that what you're suggesting? No, I'm, I'm suggesting that inner city, inner city dwellers. There are people who live within walking distance of the city, and they don't need parking because they don't need to bring their cars into the, into oh, the okay. city. So, yes, yes, sorry. So people could come from, but what about people coming from Melville? Could come to town, park for free, get on a bus, go to the base, come back, and, and they, they, I can't envisage that situation because they can just drive out of the base. Oh, okay. Um, well, so well, who I'm, would use the? Who would? Is it uh, just? People within, so people who are resident in the CBD. That's who yes, you're suggesting. Yes, oh, resident gotcha. within, Sorry. within the CBD, not just apartment dwellers in Garden Place, but people who live in Frankton and uh, near the Hamilton Lake who can just walk. Sorry, to the I, I was conf conf I, uh, sorry, I was, I was thinking in the context of free parking in town, you'd go to the. But, but no, I got you now. Okay, so it's oh, not thank primary you. Yeah, for or, that. Or, yeah. or, uh, okay, Th thank you very much, Roger, for coming today. <clears throat> right, our next submission is Aaron Wong, and he is representing Generation Zero. We've given the groups um, 10 minutes. Uh, good morning, Aaron. This is submission number 404, committee. Right, we're in your hands. Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, Councillors and the Mayor. So, um, we'll, we'll take the submissions read, but I will expand on some of the points. So, generally speaking, Gen Zero believes that this consultation was rushed and it does not represent the uh, comprehensive planning or overall strategy. We think it should have gone to long-term plan and been looked at in context with, with the benefits of it, the cost of it, with the other uh, measures, some included in the CCTP, others not included in the CCTP, as to what actually we need to fund to get the end goal of um, city centre revitalisation. Um, we, we put up a quick submission form on our website and a discussion document. So this was a spark of conversation about parking in general, because if you look at free parking uh, in an isolated way, uh, given that there was a, a parking task force which was working on a whole uh, raft of parking solutions, not necessarily just free parking, but more parking or different ways of utilising that parking, uh, it's, it's not a comprehensive way of looking at it just to look at free parking. So uh, 173 people submitted through that form and 95% uh, opposed the free parking proposal, 2% supported it, and you know that's democracy, we're, we're just trying to help people actually get their views across, and we just generally want people to be more informed, and one of the things that I'd like to put up is that if we didn't spark that conversation, people wouldn't have had their views uh, actually 
said. So that's something that does need to be remembered when you're coming to these submissions, whether they're actually uh, representing the views of everyone who, would, who, who has an opinion or whether they're just those who have the actual capital to make a submission. So like to sum up the points that came from that uh, around free parking, people wanted to invest in promoting walking, biking and bus modes. Uh, they worried that the loss in revenue could jeopardise uh, initiatives like this or could uh, distort the figures to make it seem like we cannot afford that. Um, it could increase congestion. Uh, that's something which has been brought up by other submitters, including the Regional Council. Uh, it's it's going to have more people dwelling around waiting uh, t to get through to, to get a parking space, there's going to be more idling, it's going to be more traffic, traffic's going to come, come through slower, people will want to come into town less in their cars, um, and it's, you know, it's not going to improve the utilisation, which is only about 80 or 90% within the inner city centre. Uh, one of the analogies you can use uh, against the, the idea that we want to bring, pump more drive-through traffic into the city, is that you know, drive-through traffic, uh, through traffic, it, it, they don't spend money. Uh, the other thing is if you want to go and populate one of the cafes, which I know uh, the councillors think are, are quite brilliant and you know, I tend to agree there with some of them, uh, you, know, you don't want cars going past e every, every few seconds at 50 kilometres an hour, that's why we need to have those, those lower speed limits and it, it's uh, pleasing to see council starting to move on that. Uh, the other general feedback was that this is not going to revitalise the central city and I think that's been supported by some of the um, industry groups have said that people actually need a destination to come to, they don't just want to get there easily because you know that's not going to attract them. Um, the other thing is that the, the council strategy should be and, and uh, is to, to reduce the number of cars coming into the city centre because it's a you know it's a finite space, I mean Councillor Mallet thinks it's quite large and I mean it is but it is still a finite size so growth cannot only be through just pumping more and more cars, there reaches a limit on that and perhaps we've reached that limit now. Uh, you know, there was strong support for better parking technology and the demand-dependent pricing. You know, that's already funded, so it, it was good to see that uh, as p uh, an outcome of the parking strategy. Uh, there's a lot of concern the proposal is not easily reversible. Uh, that's something which was said in Council's own report, and I don't think that's been addressed adequately. Uh, the other thing is about safety and amenity. We need to lower our dependence on building more expensive roads uh, and adding more congestion, which actually we've found is something that holds back the economy. <coughs> uh, turning now to the annual plan, uh, this was uh, not strictly within the parking proposal, but once again within the, uh, the conversation about parking in general. There was a want to, to focus on actually revitalising the central city, so that's through density, and I know people have thought that uh, that bringing people in to live in the city centre is not what, what's wanted. Well, I'm going to tell you from someone who, for, well, in my generation, not that we're currently able to afford houses, uh, we would like to live near to where we work, near to where we study, near to where we socialise. So uh, taking it from, from my generation and the people that I've talked to and the people that I represent, uh, this is what we want. It's not going to happen quickly, but it's, it's what we're going towards, and it's the international example. Uh, the other thing was, was the Garden Place car park proposal. So there was a very, very strong uh, opposition to that. Some people thought, well, do we want parking at all costs? But you know, that's, that's not what has come through. So we've actually, uh, we wrote a, myself and Rowena wrote a, uh, uh, an op-ed in the Waikato Times and uh, that sparked through the conversation and some of the comments that came out of that is what are you thinking Hamilton, why are you going back to the past? So I think it's good that we started that conversation, I would have preferred that the, the context we talked about was free parking, uh, more parking and how do we use that parking, it needs to be a comprehensive uh, conversation going on there. Uh, the other thing that we got out of this is that people generally support the river plan and the city centre transformation plan. There's a lot of good things in there. Uh, some of the things like the proposal for garden place parking are not so good, um, but we generally want to see funding and, and commitment for this because it's all very well and good having this plan, but uh, without considering it for this free parking proposal or in general, uh, it's, nothing is going to change. Um, looking at some of the problems of, of free parking, uh, the feedback has been that the price of parking is actually quite reasonable, not just from on an international scale, but for, for what it is here. I think the peop what people have brought up is that it's more difficult to actually be able to, to pay for that parking. So I've been uh, 
so looking at the proposal for better parking technology, people are saying that, okay, well, we want to go park, but we're worried about all the time limits. So what we can do with new, new technology, I mean, think about how Uber's gone. You could have an app that, that could tell you, hey, your parking's about to expire. Do you want to put some more money into it? So, you know, that, that links on quite nicely to uh, a lot of people are saying that the two-hour limit is not enough. So I know that we have parking buildings, uh, but there should be a bit more research into going, okay, we'll do what is the demand for short-term parking versus long-term parking, and does the on-street parking actually need to uh, provide that for people? Um, what we have found is that the Rotorua District Council had to drop their free parking time to 60 minutes, because even at two hours they were finding workers were still taking that up, and that's uh, anecdotally what's been showed by uh, what, what council staff have seen for the after 3 p.m. free parking. Um, Generally, there was a, a, a feeling that there needed to be a bit more coordination into revitalising the city centre uh, rather than just looking at accessing it. So accessing it is of, is, of course, not just about parking. It's about that, that act of transport, so walking, cycling and, and uh, better road access. Uh, one of the things to, to remember, though, is it's not just external access to the city centre. It's about how you get around. So what we know is there's a finite... Uh, supply of park, parking outside the shops that people want to go to, so they're going to have to walk somewhere. And if it's not an inviting or not a safe place to walk, if, if, if the speeds are too high, if there's too much traffic, or there's not enough phasing for people to walk around, that's a real impediment. So that's one of the, the, the areas where malls like the base and Chartwell do a lot better. You don't have a car driving down the middle of Chartwell or you know driving down the middle of Tiawa. You can walk around and, and not fear that you can get run over. So that's why we need to have that pedestrian priority in the city centre. So, so what we really want to look at is, is what's already in the CCTP, but unfortunately not funded uh, or, or only partially funded. So that's what we would like to see come out of a long-term plan, and we're certainly going to be advocating for that. Uh, it would have been good that the, the, uh, the free parking proposal went to long-term plan, because I think it does distort the conversation where you're only looking at the proposals in isolation. It's you know, what, what um, the representative from Sharma said, it's not choice. So we want to see more of the 30 km hour speed limits. We think it's quite good at the moment. Uh, traffic calming measures. The other thing, uh, talking about <coughs> the shared spaces. So the garden place shared space is an example of a poor shared space. Um, the, the proposal in the CCTP to extend that would actually bring it towards what uh, a shared space meant to look like. It's not meant to funnel cars through. It, it's meant to actually calm the traffic and keep the traffic from, from rat running around the city centre, which doesn't benefit anyone. So I, I think in general what, what we've taken out of this process and, and looking at our submissions and looking at the submissions that other people have made, you know, the people have spoken. that They don't want to pay for free parking because they expect it to be free. I mean, free parking sounds great, uh, but the people have looked into it and they've submitted, uh, including a lot of the businesses, uh, find that it does add up, doesn't add up for them and wouldn't add up for their customers. Uh, there needs to be less reactionary policy setting, there needs to be more coordination that actually takes respect of the council's uh, own plans. Um, I'd like to see more of the biking plan funded. It's, it's a really good plan and it was very good to see that the uh, Western Rail Trail opened, but once again, when you come to the end of the Western Rail Trail, I'm wonder if some of the councils might know this, um, ones that have gotten on their bikes, uh, you, you come to this island because you, you can't cycle down Victoria, uh, you, sorry, you can't cycle down Anglesey Street. That's a big danger there if we don't have that coordinated infrastructure. The parking task force needs to needs to be a city centre access task force. Parking is one aspect of that, but it's not the only aspect. And actually, they need to be able to finish their work and report back before we go putting proposals to people which don't uh, which don't comprehensively cover the, the actions that could be taken. I'd urge the council to to either reject this proposal now on the overwhelming opposal of it, uh, or. Uh, at least take it to the long-term plan and consider on merit alongside other city centre revitalisation projects vying for the same funding, um, many of which we believe will be more effective in the long term, uh, not take us backwards. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Uh, we will go to submission, starting with Councillor Bunting. Uh, thank you, <coughs> um, Chair. Um, Aaron, thanks for your submission. The um, parking in the central city at the moment, um, there's 18 hours a day free. Now, when that was brought in, what was Generation Zero's opinion then? Um, so we, I didn't have a specific opinion on that. I was not uh, aware of that because it didn't go out to consultation. Okay. Uh, 
it's what it has been good for is that it's shown us that uh, even though it's a there's there's a spe specified limit there, it isn't. I mean, it, what's happening is that workers are using it. So as a trial, we've already done a trial of free parking. This is it, and it's showing us the results. So there's there there is no clear metric or evidence that it's actually increased the number of people coming in. Um, but there is anecdotal evidence that it's having more workers take up car parks. So does that increase your utilisation? Yes, it does. But does that mean more people can come in? It doesn't yeah, necessarily. Cool. Thanks. Oh, no, I'm try just trying to get a clear delineation of um, your processes. Um, so if you had been asked when that came out, would you have taken a similar stance to it? Or? It's not the uh, direction that, that we think is the appropriate one to do, and I, I once again think it didn't come along with the other proposals for city centre access. Uh, it needs to be looked into context with all the other proposals. Okay. And I don't think it was. So you didn't know about it? No. Okay. So can I just clarify that point, Aaron? Did you put did Generation Zero put in a submission on the CCTP? Yes, we did put you a. Did, um, and the parking proposal. proposal was in that, and I recall mm. you making comments yes. on that. So it was consulted on, and you did submit on it. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, I will clarify. Okay. It wasn't specifically a point that we it talked to. It wasn't pulled out. Or you did make some comment in your. We submission. made we made comments that that parking and increasing the, the supply of parking or making it free is not a priority. It, it's not what we see as most effective. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Southgate. Oh. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple of quick short questions. Um, from your perspective, um, the CTTP that, um, that needs to be developed in the LTP, you're saying that uh, those people that you've um, uh, spoken widely with to, to generate your submission would prefer that if so we're spending to revitalise the CBD it would be a, um, targeted at rolling out the CTTP. Yeah, so uh, a lot of the media that was generated around that, that time was very supportive of it. I mean, th there's obviously the pushback from the point of view that people don't like their rates going up, and that's always something you're going to come up, up against as a council, and I, I think it's important to consider. Uh, but it's also something that is almost an inevitability. So that, that's what people are, are saying. They like that. When they look at free parking, they see it as going backwards, and I don't think people want to go backwards and pay for the privilege of it. And uh, in terms of the working party, the parking, uh, the t um, parking task force group, I should say, you would like to see them f complete their work, you said? Yeah, so I think it's important that they actually present the, the full options and we, and we take that and, and consult on that as a whole in context with other uh, measures to increase, uh, well, to improve city centre access, not just looking at one proposal which was talked about but wasn't necessarily formed by the working group. Okay, so, so and you'd like that, if that to continue and take a more integrated approach in terms of accessibility of the CBD, which might include parking and might include a lot of other little things as well. Yeah, so a lot of interest, so, so something good that did come out of that was that we saw that there is uh, a very wide range of parking utilisation in the CBD and, and it's more about trying to manage where people park and how long they park for, so that's why we're advocating for uh, demand dependent prices to give people that choice. And I've got the impression, though, I don't think you stated it um, explicitly, that you um, support the rollout of the technology towards apps and um, demand responsive solutions through technology. Yeah, so parking is, we're not opposed to parking on pure ideology, but there is a finite limit to doing that. If we look at the international example, you do need parking, but increasingly it's becoming irrelevant with more people switching to public transport, more people going on, on, on the likes of Uber. Uh, so we, we don't need to increase parking, is what we're saying, but what, what we're looking at is how do we utilise this better, because we've got the parks there, uh, but currently they're not being utilised effectively, and I don't think anyone benefits from that. And you made some comments about international cities and, and younger populations wanting to live where everything's happening, just to put words in your mouth, mm -hmm. but um, what kind of, um, well, you know, and there's a lot of dynamic cities that show that trend, what kind of activities um, do younger portions of our community want to see in a CBD? Is it shopping? Is it mall shopping? Or what is it? And we've heard from other people today who would like top-end boutique retail. Mm. Um, we've had some talk about cafes, what, what do um, the younger portion, of which you represent, I don't, of Hamilton, um, feel would revitalise a central city area? 
Um, I, I think part of it is having those spaces where we can gather, and those spaces can be public open spaces, they can be cafes, they can be bars. I know we have very good nightlife in Hamilton, so that's that's some success there, and that's because it's you know condensed down um, in a very developed area. So uh, all those things, shopping as well, uh, students and in, in generally in the market for, for buying big thing, big. Uh, ovens and if they do you can get it delivered so there's not so much to limit anymore and you know look at young professionals the, it's the same thing online shopping does change the nature of that so there's no need for big box retail in the CBD what we do want is that sort of leisure shopping that you do not because you need it but because you want it and that's where you're always going to get the dollar out of people so I think having the wide range of, of, of shops there having uh, events as well is really important because you, uh, sorry Hamilton has tried to be an event city and I think that's something that we can still excel at doing uh, and the city centre should be at the heart of that, so that's why Garden Place is a really, really vital asset. And I think that's really going to be the, the, the focal point for the city as a meeting point and as an event space. Just on that, the final question, Madam Chair. Um, um, given that some, there's been some good events over summer. Yeah. Yeah, the three-on-three -three basketball, um, the murals going up and all of those really cool things. Now, um, what's your view, therefore, if, um, if you were servicing events on a weekend, free parking on a Saturday? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> the, so it, it's about uh, the mess... It's, part of it is about the message it sends and part of it is about the effect it has. So people do need parking to, to get to places at the moment because there isn't that alternative there. But if we look at the really big events that do happen in Hamilton, look at the night glow, that's like the only traffic jam we have all year. But what we have is we have park and ride buses. So uh, that's not necessarily, uh, a park and ride is not necessarily the best solution. Obviously we'd prefer that people be able to walk or cycle to their bus stop and get on their bus and get to their end to end to their destination. But what it does show is the most effective way of moving people people is by public transport. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Taylor. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, Aaron, thanks for the submission. Um, you, you make a, um, a point about um, open spaces and a priority on pedestrian in the inner city. And I guess I'm just wondering aloud how well that works in a provincial city, you know, our size, rather than a place like Melbourne or something. Um, because if you look at our best example of a pedestrian area, it's Garden Place. And I don't know if I would hold that up high as a great example of the way I want things to be at the moment. It's pretty empty sort of space. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, so I think that needs to be looked into context with Council's own plans and own messaging. So what we've seen from, I think it was the City Centre Transformation Plan, is that we want to be the third regional economy in the country. So we're not going to be that provincial town. And if we follow that uh, path and the example of other provincial towns, we're never going to get to that. And I think what a key driver of what this Council wants is, is economic development and, and, and growth. But it needs to be growth which delivers quality. But we're not going to be in Melbourne either, are we? Well, we're not going to be in Melbourne in the near future. Melbourne's got about four five million people in it. Hamilton's got about 160,000. But that doesn't mean we can learn from what has worked there and what hasn't worked there. And we clearly see that they're not putting a car park in their town square. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is um, you ca you're, you're comparing apples and oranges there. I, I don't think, yeah, well, what would, well, if anything, we're uh, comparing a, an undeveloped apple which has been neglected and is half rotten because we haven't invested in it, we haven't looked after it, you haven't watered it and haven't nurtured it. So if we look at Garden Place as it currently is, uh, there's been a lot of different changes made there. Some of them ha have been less effective than others. So what we need to look at is what has worked for those open spaces and that's not what the current plans for Garden Place show. So if we only look at uh, what we have now rather than looking at what we could actually have from other people, it's not going to give us a, a fair comparison. I don't think open spaces uh, are, are meant to look like this. It's a good start. It's the, in fact the only green space really in the centre of Hamilton. I think a lot of people value that. Uh, but it, it's not as good as it could be, and I don't think putting a car park in the middle of it is, is going to make it better. No, nor do I, nor do I. I'm just not sure as many people value Garden Place as you're saying. Well, I mean, that's certainly what we've heard, and, and there's been a lot they? of... Oh, well, there's been a lot of media uh, comments, so there's been multiple media articles, and if you look on social media, I mean, I know you're a media consultant, you can see that people are pretty vocal about that. We, we don't want that because it's so lovely to go and have our lunch, and, you know, it could be better because it's the focal point for your events. It's the heart of the city, really. Okay, thank you, Councillor Taylor. Uh, Councillor Mallett. 
Thank you, and thanks, Aaron, for your very energetic submission. Well done. Um, just, uh, just taking a slightly high, high level thing, you, you understand that clearly the goal of this is not so much to improve parking in the CBD, it's to improve parking in the CBD so that the CBD can grow you know, and, and benefit and, and become vibrant or something. Yeah, so the thing with free parking is that doesn't necessarily, and in fact, it probably does the opposite of utilising yeah, your okay, existing so, parking. So, so, sorry, yeah, so I guess I was saying that the free parking was, is only seen, and I think we'd all agree with this, is seen as a means to an end. Rather, it's not about getting free parking into town, it's about improving the number of people coming into town, supporting yeah, so businesses within the CBD. What I'm trying to say is that it's a very poor means to get to that end. So what we okay, have okay, is... OK, so that, yeah, that, that, that's, that's the answer that I was expecting. Yeah, it's, okay. it's a poor means okay. to get to the end because so it doesn't the, help is, us utilise the, the existing the supply. the right end? Well, the end of having a, a vibrant city centre to help us be that third regional economy, to actually have a focal point for this mm. town to, to have... Well, this city to, mm. to have that that growth that is going to deliver a better quality of life for all mm. Hamiltonians, that's the right end to get to, and that focuses on international experience of more people wanting to move to cities. It's not that, that hasn't live happened, by malls. That hasn't happened in Hamilton yet. No, because and, we haven't Hamilton, been taking the right the, policy settings to get there. OK, and the people from Hamilton have been... Uh, are simply, and as Jeff was saying, you, know, you, you talked about the Garden Place being something. Um, but people are voting with their feet. They're just not coming, are they? No, I, I, I don't disagree. Uh, sorry, I don't agree with that. People are voting... Hang on, hang on. You, people... don't, you don't agree people aren't coming? Just no, look no, out there no now. I don't agree for the reasons yeah. that, that you think they are, that you're okay. implying they are. Yeah. So No, I don't, I don't know why they're not coming. I'm just saying clearly you, you agree that people aren't coming to the CBD, are they? Well, and people, are, people are coming to the CBD. A lot of people are also going to the base because the base offers a different product. But mm. what we need to see is that the, the city centre does what it can to be a, a destination for people. I mean, mm. that's what the property council said, and you know, that's not necessarily the organisation you think I might align with. But this is what the business is saying: you need to provide a destination, and that's that's not really strongly what the city centre is delivering at the moment. And I don't and, think parking is the way to do that. Whose responsibility is it to deliver that um, destination? It is, it is um, businesses, but at the same time, council does have levers they can pull. So things like the district plan, things like this free parking proposal, how they manage that, uh, management of garden place, just the general amenity the council provide. The council is a big organisation, and the council uh, can, can do a lot to actually foster that growth and, and inspire that confidence, you because you do need to get businesses on board. OK, are you aware that the CBD and revitalising the CBD has been a repeated... Um, mantra from this entity, uh, from the City Council for decades, for a couple of decades, and we have, and the CBD has spent, uh, the City Council has spent millions of dollars okay. um, trying to, re no, I just want to make sure you understand the concept, has spent millions of, of ratepayers' dollars trying to re, trying to get it right. You know, we've gone from two lanes to one lane, we've cobbled things, we've redone Hood Street, we've done, redone Garden Place numerous times. So in terms of, um, uh, the goal, which is not so much free parking, but to revitalise the CBD, because we need to remember why we're so, doing this. So, Councillor Mallett, sorry, you uh, do what, need What is your comment there? Thank you. Well, my, my comment there is, yes, the, the, the Council has been working at this for a long time, because clearly the, the, the ratepayers, all Hamiltonians, and the Council think it's really important. So that's not just saying, well, we've tried for a long time, let's give up. What it is shows is this is really, really important, and we want to get it right. So, yes, the Council's invested in the City Centre, but the Council's also invested uh, in a Road, which just so happens to, to serve the outer city, uh, the base and, and other malls. So you can see why, yes, you're investing in one thing, but you're also investing in the other thing. It's not that you revoke your investment from, from one thing, but I don't think we've had the, the balance that we, we've needed to, to actually get the result that I think most people want. Do you think the council could ever be wrong? I, I don't think anyone's infallible. I think the council's uh, been been doing a lot of good things, and but I don't think free parking is going to be one of those good things. Thank you. Thank you, councillor. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, um, just, I think in your quote, in terms of New Zealand cities around revitalisation of CBD, I think in your sources you've, you've referenced Rotorua. Is, mm. is there any other towns in Australasia that you would advise as Generation Zero for us to have a good look at? I know, think of, and again, of yeah. small, smaller cities, obviously. Um, well, I, I think Auckland's the, the most the, the, the most similar example that we can think of in, in terms of where the stage that they're at now and the stage that they were at before. So they had a, a city centre which was very 
um, unattractive to go to. Uh, it was very hard to access, mm. and you know, you know how they've solved it is not by having free parking. They've had record investment in public transport. They've actually provided that pedestrian-friendly uh, space so people can walk up and down Queen Street, spend their money. They've got all these big uh, boutique retailers going in. Uh, you know, that's attracting people in, into the city centre. So while that is at a different stage to where Hamilton is at, it's still comparable because it is a local context, it is within the same sort of uh, government policy framework, it's something that we can look at and go, well, what's worked there and what hasn't worked? And what we've seen that they haven't done is made parking free. If anything, it's gone up because you have that restricted supply. But at Hamilton, uh, the, the supply in Hamilton is just not utilised properly at this point. Um, overseas, if you look at Germany, Holland, I mean, I notice in German cities similar size to Hamilton, they have the town square like Garden Place. There's usual cobbles, and sometimes of the week you have some car parking, you have local markets, you have the whole, you know, you have a very mixed use approach, including good public transport. Is, is there any specific, again, if you come back to us, there may be some specific, I'm just looking at towns of a similar population to Hamilton that may be some good guides for us? Yeah, so I, I'm, there's a lot of research that can be done, and that's why I would have advocated that this came to the long-term plan, where it can right. be looked at in context with other things. I mean, I'm, I'm currently here on my own time taking unpaid leave, so sure. I don't have the time to do this. No, no. But this is exactly what Council should be doing, is, is doing that wider reading, looking at international uh, examples, and, and not just jumping at the first thing which comes up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Aaron, thank you. for coming today and submitting. Right, we're on to uh, submission number 276, and this is Jeff Krieger. <coughs> Jeff, where are you? There he is. Jeff, you're familiar with the process, the bell will ding, leave some time for questions. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to Council. <clears throat> City Council acknowledge that the CBD is in a death spiral. The introduction to the Central City Transformation Plan reveals this. It says the combined powers of supermarkets, shopping malls and the internet are squeezing the life out of the CBD. <coughs> Free parking strikes at democracy. <coughs> democracy equals freedom and one of those freedoms is choice. With choice, there are consequences. Choice is at the heart of those who choose to shop in the central city. The consequences are the availability to park and the cost to park. That is the individual's choice. With the free parking proposal, those who choose not to shop in the CBD or are unable to do so or do not own a car, the consequences are they still pay. Free parking is in direct contrast and conflicts with the district plan, the 10-year plan and the central city transformation plan. It completely undermines the spirit of these plans. It is also diametrically opposed to both the parking management plan and the active travel action plan, with their focus on cycling, walking and busing. Surprisingly, it is also in direct conflict with the summary of proposed budget changes of this very plan. The free parking proposal also conflicts with the various statements of rates certainty throughout the 10-year plan to hold, limit, not exceed rate increase of 3.8%. The consultation document uses phrases such as the indicative rates impact, the indicative full year rates, and average property, which are meaningless, considering that the targeted rate is an increase to access Hamilton, which is calculated on the capital value of the property. Changing the rate in the dollar to achieve a $26 indicative rate rise <coughs> is a 23.61% increase to access Hamilton rate. In my immediate neighbourhood, the increase ranges from $28.75 to $37.34. The parking management plan states under the heading of pricing, 
as much as possible. Users should pay directly for the cost of providing parking. This reduces the cost for those who do not use parking. If free parking was the panacea to revitalise the CBD, the Central Business Association and the business owners would do it themselves, and they would have done it by now. The CBD businesses will receive a direct benefit from free parking, therefore they should fund it, not the residential ratepayer. There is two hours free parking at Centre Place, with a purchase of $10 or more, and four hours at Hoyt Cinemas. The Lawrenson Group have free parking at the Wilson Car Park in Alexandra Street and the Knox Street Car Park with a spend of more than $20. Free parking did not attract more people, nor revitalise the CBD in a number of other cities and cost a considerable amount of money. It has been an abject failure. Can't we learn the lessons from others? Why do we have to give it a go to see if it works? And it beg begs the question, what if it doesn't work? Thank you very much, Jeff. We'll go to questions. Councillor Mallett's up first. Thanks, Jeff, for your submission. Uh, you said free parking hasn't worked in other cities. Yep. Do you have the names of those cities? Lower Hutt, Pororua, New Plymouth and Rotorua. OK. Um, Lower Hutt. New Plymouth, yep, so those two have been mentioned before. Porirua and Rotorua. Porirua and Rotorua, was it? Yep. Um, when you say it hasn't worked, and you, you may not, I might ask something that's beyond what your analysis is, what, what metrics do they mean it hasn't worked? So have they, they pulled back from their, they've, they've overturned that decision and don't do it anymore? Or uh, mo most of them have, yes, most of them have. Lower Hutt did um, quite a detailed analysis on um, the amount of people that came into the CBD with the free parking, and it actually dropped quite markedly uh, during the period of the, of the free parking. So there were fewer people coming fewer in? Fewer people actually came in. Did, they, uh, did the report say why people um, didn't come in? It didn't actually say that, but in Rotorua, a lot of it was um, the businesses um, themselves, particularly the, uh, the, the buildings, uh, were run down and the business owners weren't, um, weren't prepared to revitalise the actual building structure uh, and that's what basically nailed Rotorua. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Taylor. Jeff, uh, you mentioned that uh, Lawrence and Group um, offers free parking and uh, Centre Place offers free parking. Why do you think they do that? Attract customers. Exactly. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Taylor, that was nice, well, yeah, no, short and... Nice. Yeah. <laughs> exactly what, exactly I, I, to that took me by surprise. Mayor Andrew. Oh. Oh, it's OK. You can go first. I'll go after the Mayor. Oh, sorry. Oh, Presentation. Well, were you aware that the four New Zealand towns that you have quoted and didn't have number plate recognition. So the reports that I've read showed that the you the people who came in to spend couldn't get parks because the people who worked in the shops were parking in a park for two hours, then getting in their car and moving it to another place in town, filling up the parks, and there was nothing available. And that Hamilton system is the first time it's been used in New Zealand, although it has been used offshore. Um, which is recording the number plate of the vehicle that's parked in a park so that they can cap any car from parking for more than two hours anywhere in the CBD, even if it moves from park to park? Um, yeah, you're quite correct. Um, but um, Coastlands um, employ number plate recognition, and um, recently there have been quite a few roar of that. Uh, they've had to put up a ginormous sign uh, detailing the conditions of using that um, particular car park. Uh, and they use number plate recognition. Um, the difficulty with that is, is that the contract is with the driver, the enforcement is with the vehicle. And a classic example is that um, my wife can come into town under this proposal, uh, park in, in town for an hour 30 uh, and go away. I come in in the afternoon in the same vehicle and I park there for another hour and a half and get a ticket because 
the number plate recognition only recognises the car, not the individual. So are you aware that there's private car parks in Hamilton that use number plate recognition? Yeah. And that it works? Well, I don't know. I haven't delved into it. And that it is the car, not the driver? That's how it yeah, works? Yeah, but that, this is a proposal that is going to cost the rate payer, mm. so we have a direct uh, interest in it, and it is already we've got some, some flaws in it, in the enforcement of it. Yeah, my, my point is, is that the four cities that you've used as examples, it didn't use number plate recognition. Oh, fine, but it didn't work either. S yeah, because the people who use, who worked in the shops were filling up the car parks, so there were no car parks for the people who came to spend money, according to the, the reports that have been circulated. Hence, Napier recently pulled their uh, free parking for, this, for that very reason. Mm. That was an are you aware question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Right, sorry, Councillor Bunting. Um, thank you. Just, just um, extending from that, Jeff, you're talking about um, your wife coming in shopping and stuff. One of the, um, having said on the task force, one of the issues we found was uh, what they call the worker shuffle or people taking up <coughs> parks for a long period of time. So there was, it was just getting blocked. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest is a good solution to that? Um, probably um, the the parks that tend to get blocked. If you have a look at um, the the parking, and, and you would know that more than more than I would, there was oodles of car parks uh, on the fringes of the mm. central city. It's the ones in the central city themselves that are that tend to get blocked. That's right. An easy way to fix that is to is have a pricing differential. Yeah, or a limit. Perhaps there already is a limit. Yeah, yeah. Two hour limit. There is already, right? Yeah, there's already a limit. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, any other ideas on that? And just uh, well, you, you say that the parking proposal is going to go from 8 to 8. To eight. Are, they, are they going to... Going I think so, yeah. I think are so. we going to extend the hours of the, the parking Nazis? Oh, I mean, the, the parking wardens? I think that's a bit unkind in their defence. Yeah. It is unkind. But, by the way... Well, un unless you're going to enforce no, it... Well. No. But unless you're going to enforce it, it's a waste of time, haven't it? Right, okay. Okay, I think I get you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Right. Um, submission. Uh, John Lawson is up next, and this is submission number 163. And then we have three more after that, and then we are done for the day. Good morning, John. Or oh, good afternoon, John. Welcome. <laughs> You've got five minutes. The bell will go at four, and just leave a bit of time for questions. Okay, Kia ora koutou. Um, it seems to me that, uh, as some speakers have already said, this is a premature proposal in that you've not fully looked into the options. And to, um, I would support actually bringing it forward as part of a long-term plan, um, as was discussed by a few people. Because it seems to me that the problem has arisen since I moved into Hamilton, what's it, 1999? Um, and then I think we used the base as a dog training area because uh, it was a big open space. Mm -hmm. And since then, everything's changed. You had Chartwell at that time, but that was far less of a competitor with the CBD. And to the, the, it seems to me that the thing that the CBD has got that those base and Chartwell and the other centres haven't got is the, being the centre of Hamilton, being the place where uh, the cycleways, busways, um, the river actually brings people to, and therefore, it seems to me you ought to be looking at those um, advantages that the CBD has got over the other shopping areas and developing that, because Hamilton's got very low public transport use, 2% travel to work, and that, that means that the other 98% don't travel by bus, uh, which gives you a huge potential, 98% um, of people who could actually start using buses if only you gave them a decent transport service. Um, I don't know how many of you actually use the buses regularly, but uh, having a half hourly service is not greatly attractive. And it really, um, if you're looking at free parking, how about free bus services as well? It seems to me odd to be proposing something which is going to increase the congestion problems. Because I noticed that Tom Tom's recently said that traffic congestions increased 5% in Hamilton. <clears throat> and last time I tro drove over Puketty Bridge, I noticed that there was a huge traffic jam going the opposite direction. 
five o'clock in the evening, and um, th there are traffic jams gradually around Hamilton that never used to exist when I first came here. Um, they <coughs> N NZTA last year produced a very useful, I thought, um, document, Benefits of Investing in Cycling in New Zealand Communities, and they talk about retailers often overestimating the number of people who've driven to their stores, um, overestimate the contribution of car parks to their business, um, overestimate travel times by bike, <coughs> and um, suggesting that it can often be quicker on a bicycle than by motor vehicle including distances of up to five kilometers. Um, so <coughs> it seems to me that there's a whole series of things you could be doing apart from looking at this very expensive proposal. And there are examples all around the world of where um, studies have looked at the sort of thing that uh, NZTA is mentioning in that. So that they're going on the basis of lots of examples um, in Europe, in North America, um, even in Australasia. Um, for example, it was a Takapuna study talking about pedestrianisation, um, improving economic performance, encouraging high-end retail options, improving personal security, enhancing health, uh, enhancing health outcomes. And so um, I could go on with lots of examples, but I realise that you're running late. I wonder whether you might look at road charging as well, which is another option. Um, but again, it would take time to develop that and compare the options. So. With that, I'll finish and see if you've got any questions. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Right, we'll go to questions. Councillor Mallet. Thank you, John, for your <coughs> excuse me for your submission. Um, you're aware that, well, my understanding is I'm pretty sure that's accepted around here that the rationale for the parking uh, task force was to try and regenerate the CBD, which I'm, I think uh -huh. I'm correct in saying. Um, what part of your submission? address that well the part so I just that, to, go on, sorry. yeah well the part that said that there are other ways of doing it um that that was the whole point of the nzta um uh, document that i was quoting from <coughs> which said that retailers often overestimate the number of people who've driven to their stores and their contribution of car parks to their business so if you're overestimating that and taking it as an assumption that actually you need more car parks you need to make them cheaper and that's the way to go, then you're starting from a false assumption. Didn't your stats, and I think it was your stats, suggested that 98% of people freely choose when given the choice to drive a car? Well, I also said it's a half hourly bus service and how many of you use it? <laughs> well, clearly 98% clearly don't, so you yeah. know the answer to that. So people have chosen to use their car. Well, why, why are people What's the here problem different? With that? Because throughout the world, it's usually about 20, 25%, 30% of people who use public transport in big cities. So and yet why, here why is that a problem? Well, here, um, the, the quality of the public eh? transport is so much worse. Yeah. It's very often quicker to walk than catch the bus, especially when the bus goes all around the houses yeah. to get to anywhere. Yeah. So you know, it's not surprising that really the very basic minimum of people are using the bus. Mm. which, as I say, gives you that huge mm. uh, potential market for people who might use the bus and might consider going to a CBD mm. rather than driving to get stuck in a traffic jam at the base or uh, chart uh, well. Uh, are you aware that the bus service now is, is heavily subsidised? And you, you say, I don't, I don't know too much about it, but you said it's half hourly um, things, half hourly pickups or something. <laughs> yeah. So well, do, it, you, do you think if we, and you suggested that was a detriment to using the bus. Mm -hmm. So presumably if we go from half hourly, and the buses are not heavily used at all, as we understand, because you said 2% mm -hmm. of people use other than public transport, and some of that will be cycles, some of that will be walking. A tiny, tiny bit of it must be buses. If we then um, double the number of buses or bus on, on the road, won't we, uh, the, the subsidy will blow us out of the water, won't it? Well, no, it just fill up the empty seats on the buses. <laughs> uh, but if you double the supply but don't increase the demand, the math doesn't work, John. Well, it, it does, because w w why does it work elsewhere and why doesn't it work here? It's well, because possibly because you're comparing a city okay, with so two we, or three. Well, 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 hang yeah, on, no, this is, no, this is really important. I know you're teasing out your questions, but let's keep it. So possibly you're questions. comparing a city of 2 million with a city of 160,000 and, and a, a city of people who have 
welcome the freedom that they have from public uh, private transport and use that to express that freedom. Yeah, there's much smaller cities that have tried this and succeeded. And, and uh, say they're around the world. And it, I think one of the ones which struck me most was the mayor of a city down in southern Brazil where th they realized that it was a problem with the businesses and they decided to convert an area to pedestrianization over a weekend so to avoid the protests of the businesses. And there were protests, but uh, after a short time they realized it was actually working and they actually extended it. So it seems to me that that's the sort of example to look at and that it ought to be tried here because it never has been and otherwise the CBD's got no advantage compared to the base or Chartwell or wherever. Do you think it's uh, the role of the local authority to favour one shopping precinct over another? Well, so far the local authority has favoured the base and Chartwell by insisting that developers there provided free car parking when they de were developing them. So it's a matter of working out now how to redress that imbalance that you've created. Not you personally, but the council. You think the council forcing people um, to invest in something is a bonus? Well, so far you've forced investors to create free parking because you've got parking standards which require them to do so. Okay. Mm. Yep. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, thanks, John, for your submission today. Thank you. Right, the next submitter up is Mike McFall, and this is submission number 389, and I apologise, committee, I thought we only had three submitters left, but we have several, so we will, after the submitter, be stopping for a quick lunch break. So submission 389. Good afternoon, Mike. Welcome. <coughs> yeah, good morning. Uh, oh, you know good morning, uh, Mayor, Mayor Andrew, and members of the Hamlet City Council. Um, Council, as I understand, the basic functions are to maintain an environment, which is good for our city, our citizens, uh, provide the services which we need as a community, but also third, to have a growth strategy um, for, for the future. Um, I'm making this submission because I've watched as our price, price of homes has is burgeoned out of, out of control just about, and locking many, many of the young people, the younger generation, out of the prospect of owning their own homes. Um, I think the council can do something about this. Um, one of the, the proposals in my submission is that um, there be a, a rate extension on, on the sale of a home that's based on the price over and above a, a council-determined value. Um, for example, uh, in the in the maths here, if based based on a price at the first of January two thousand sixteen of uh, oh, sorry first of January yep, two thousand sixteen uh, it was three hundred eighty thousand. Um, if the council decided to raise that base value by some percentage each year, um, a year later first of January two thousand seventeen. Um, that that value would become four hundred thousand. If it sold for five hundred thousand, which was twenty five percent above that, then the rates would be increased. Uh, an extension on the rates would be increased thereby. Um, the the reasons for for this are firstly to pr to provide some mechanism to dampen down the the housing market, and secondly to provide extra revenue for council to provide um, more, more growth, uh, funds for growth of the city. Um, the, I've addressed some of the concerns here perhaps people might have um, about paying ex extra rates, but my response, response to that is that uh, because the extra rate charge is here, it will have the effect of lowering the purchase price of the home and all, all the associated costs, borrowing and mortgage interest costs, and so the, the buyer would be pretty much no, no worse off. Um, the mechanism is diverting uh, a lot of the funds that are going to the, the seller um, and, and putting it basically into council coffers, coffers which I think uh, the council can, can do with. Um, the, just a 
point, the council regulates, uh, I, I mentioned on the, on the basic function that the council does a lot of, th has a responsibility to maintain an environment which is good for the city. And we do that through a lot of different controls and regulations. Uh, we regulate animals and just about everything that moves. Um, but we don't do any regulation on at all or anything to actually regulate the, the price of homes. Now, one of the factors is that um, part of the problems is obviously supply is not keeping up with the demand. And I think it would be good to have an exemption for first occupiers of a new home. I think it would be, uh, it's worthwhile to make it easier to and cheaper to buy a new home uh, off, the, off the block then. Because uh, by, by discouraging, we want to encourage more, home, home, uh, more homes to be built. Um, so that's the basis of my submission. Um, any questions? So just to clarify, you do or do not, you don't support the, the parking proposal, is that right? I made a separate submission, which I haven't spoken to uh, on that matter, which involved a 70 minute free parking in a yeah. one hour. Okay, one so, hour charge. so do you yeah. support for it? Do you support the proposal? Not in the current form, no. Not in the current form, but you support some proposal, which you've reflected in. Yes. Okay, all right. I just needed yeah. that clarification. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Mallet. Uh, thanks, Mike. I think we might have got the wrong um, <laughs> submission from you today because uh, we're on the parking at the moment. But just, just oh, okay. with regard to your um, point. Are you aware that we are progressively moving to a capital value rating system? Yes, somewhere of that. Okay, so how does that does that address what you're talking about? Because my, my assumption is you're trying to, I don't think it'll work, but you're trying to suppress house increases by um, increasing the rates charged against a property as the value of the property goes up, and you think that will be a detriment to the uh, increase of price of the house, is that right? Yes, yes so it, it will have the effect of, of lowering the, the rate of increase of the yeah, okay. houses. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Okay, um, committee, we still have, as I said, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine submitters to speak. We can carry on, um, or we can stop for lunch break. Do you want to carry on? Yep, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. I know that. Um, Mr. Henebury's gone off for lunch, so as soon as he comes back, we'll. Uh, no, because I did indicate we were going to stop for lunch, but. A small cup. Let, let's stop for. Um, yeah, no, let's stop for five minutes and we'll see if we can find um, Roger Henebury because he was up next. Yeah, no.
can do the whistle, but I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah. Very loud. Comes in handy in a crowd. Like a full on. You just, I just decided one day I was going to teach myself, and I did. And Oh, did you? Oh. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six. We need one more. Yep. Oh, Ziggy's, Ziggy's here. Seven. Okay. All right. Let's get going. We'll see how we go. Hopefully we won't have to. Hopefully we'll get through this before lunch, before we have to stop for lunch. Right, we're up to, um, uh, next person up is Alan Young, um, in submission 129. And I do apologise, everyone, for us going over time, but it's important we get to hear everybody's uh, views on the on the issues. Right, the bell will go at, ding at four minutes and then wind up and we'll have questions. Good afternoon. Thanks for um, allowing me to speak today. Um, I'm, I oppose this proposal um, to make parking free in the Hamilton CBD. The proposal doesn't benefit all the residents of, and ratepayers. It doesn't even benefit the majority. Uh, only a small number of businesses in the Hamilton CBD stand to gain. And that is fundamentally unfair to the majority of ratepayers and, and on that basis alone shouldn't be allowed to pass. The idea, I guess, is that um, residents from outlying suburbs in Hamilton will flock to the CBD to do their shopping. Um, I can't chances. see this happening, to be honest. Uh, there might be an initial upsurge in, in, in people coming in while the novelty um, value is, is there, but that'll wear off fairly quickly and people will slip back into their old habits and customs and, and go to the shops where they, they're used to, sh to shopping. Um, a serious problem I think that's faced by people coming into the CBD is, is the inability to find car parking spaces. I know I've, I've suffered from that. This proposal only partially um, addresses that. The, the number plate recognition is good, but uh, not everybody's going to, well, not everybody's going to want to spread their their time to come into into the CBD throughout the day. So it's not necessarily going to work, and and potentially the situation for parking is only going to be worse. Um, a loud argument in favour of the proposal seems to be that. Um, Parking in the CBD needs to be free so that you, uh, to compete with bikes of the base and Chartwell Shopping Centre where, where you don't pay. That's great propaganda in my view, um, but there's no such thing as free parking. True, the base and, and Chartwell aren't or can't charge uh, shoppers, but those parking spaces still need to be maintained and the businesses that, that are, are, or, are Operating out of those centres must be building the cost into the into their the ch what they're charging consumers, because ultimately the consumer always pays. <coughs> and secondly, I I, it, I struggle to understand when it became the the council's responsibility on behalf of ratepayers to subsidise businesses in the CBD. And that's what this proposal is, in my view. It's a subsidy. For, uh, paid by everyone for the benefit of a very few. If the CBD businesses want free parking in the CBD, then they should pay for it. And I'm, I'm not even sure that that's what they want. But I don't think it's fair to expect ratepayers to be saddled with a cost that they might not get any benefit from. And I considered, you know, one of my the things, people, groups I considered was elderly ratepayers who rarely, if ever, come into, into the CBD. Is it fair that, that people are living on, on relatively fixed incomes should be hit by a rates increase to pay for something they, they don't use or won't use? In my view, no, it's, it's not fair. Already the uh, Hamilton City Council rates are increasing faster than the rate of inflation. Um, and we were, we were told that there would be rate certainty over a period of 10 years. Adding another rate to pay for free parking in CBD is just, in my view, outrageous 
and, and goes against everything that, that we were promised as, as ratepayers. The prime responsibility of, of the council is to ensure that essential services are, are provided and properly maintained. I don't think free parking is, is, is an essential service, and I can't see how any, anybody could argue that it is. And over time, successive councils have tried to reinvigorate the CBD, and millions of dollars, as somebody said earlier, has been spent. Um, so far, it's without, without complete success. I don't disagree that it's important to have a, a, a healthy and viable CBD, but I do disagree that the council should be solely responsible for making this happen. Attracting more cars to this, into the central city isn't going to fix underlying problems. It's just going to make traffic congestion worse. I live in, Char in Flagstaff and I choose to shop at Chartwell, the base and Rotatuna simply because those are they're more convenient to me and easier to get to and you know take a shorter time if I, if I, you know, I, and I drive there. I occasionally come into Hamilton City, into the cent central city, and um, I pay for parking because I accept that that's what's expected. Um, but ratepayers shouldn't be forced to subsidise businesses through this free parking <coughs> proposal. The only other thing I'd like to say is that as councillors and the mayor, you, you're elected by the people to serve the interests of all, the, the, all your um, constituents. If you vote for this proposal to go ahead, or if you're thinking of voting to, for it to go ahead, just ask yourself, is it in the best interest of all my constituents? And if you can't answer yes to that, then you've got to vote against it. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Councillor Mallet. Thank you, Alan. That was a very concise um, uh, submission. Just th three points I picked out of it. I want to make sure I got it right. You don't think it'll work? I don't think it'll work, no. Secondly, you don't favour, um, you don't think councils should be favouring the CBD over other parts of the city? No. Why should they? And thirdly, you, would pr you don't favour user pays being changed to rate pay pays. Exactly. I think, you know, if, you, if, you, if I want to use See, a parking space... See, I was listening. Space, yeah, if I want to use a parking space <laughs> in town, I expect to pay for it. OK. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mallet. Right, thanks. Oh, Councillor Bunting? No. no? OK. Thanks, Alan. There are no further questions. Thank, Thank you. you. I don't see Roger Henebury here back again yet, so uh, we'll go to Malcolm Barrett. This is submission 440. Uh, and Malcolm is speaking on behalf of GBG Management Trust. I'm yep. not too sure who they are, but I'm sure you'll tell us. So you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Or oh, afternoon, rather. Um, speaking on behalf of GBG Management Trust, which manages um, four office towers in Hamilton with a total floor area of about 33,000 square metres. One of them is the farmer's building, um, which we're currently re the architects call it re um, And I've deliberately avoided providing you with too much information because the last time I gave you spreadsheets and I don't think anybody <laughs> understood any of it. Um, so I've avoided it this time. Um, uh, yeah. I realise how much paper I don't read, so I yeah. presume you're the same. Um, but what I wanted to do is take an opportunity to um, explain the impact of the option of charging rates to the CBD um, operators and what that impact is going to have and also just a brief summary of the car parks that we own and around us and what the impact is now and where you're going in the future and what the future outlook is for car parks. Because whatever you do, you've actually got to build car parks in the CBD, not necessarily right in the core, but certainly within comfortable walking distance, which is what the, the old farmer's car park is. That holds 743 car parks. Um, now, just to go back to the issue of rates and how the impact it has, um, the just take for an example KPMG Tower, which is 6,800 square metres of floor space. In, when you were doing it in about two, um, uh, 2014, I think it was, or 15, that you were looking at going to capital value rating, 
um, the rates uh, using land value on that particular tower, not the whole complex, but to give that was 47,800. <coughs> this year they've gone to 61,200. And so if you extrapolate that over the, it's gonna get a lot worse. Uh, it'll go about 150% without the increase in the normal increase in annual rates, but that's taking the same number. It'll be 150% more moving to capital. However, that is an existing building. So it's not its replacement cost. So if you guys are looking to the future of Hamilton, you have to be prepared to look at the type of complex that that is, which covers a floor area, or it's got a gross floor area of about 50,000 square metres, which is two towers, and it will be Waikato DHB on the bottom floor, um, and then you'll have 700 odd car parks. So that's the balance that you need to create in the CBD. The replacement cost of that building that we've got it insured for, for getting the land, is $143 million. So that's what it would cost to build a new one. So if you guys want another one built um, like that, it'll be it'll cost you that. So add on the land. So you've then got a, a the land value is only 5.8 million. So you've got a cost of 148, 149 million. On taking your rates this year, your rate value this year, rate collection, plus your capital value addition, and because that's two years into a 10 year process, so multiply it by five. The, a new building of that size and that earning capacity will be paying a total rate of $4.4 million. So that's the reason that you guys are building a shambles because you are penalising development in the CBD. You have to move from land to capital which means that you're penalising expensive tall buildings. You're, you are encouraging poor use of land. Now, if you take that over, a, if we come back to a car park, if you, the, um, if you built a new car park today, it would cost you around 45, probably $50,000 per car park. Um, that works out per car park at $32 per car park per week. We've got like a DHB to come in. We have leased them car parks at $35. And the market won't pay any more than about, we get a few at about 40. So what you, your, what you have done is prevented anybody from building a new car park for the public or even for shop, uh, for staff in the CBD. So the increase over, um, from, um, based on the, um, I'll just leave it at that. So it would cost $33 million out of the $143 million to replace the car park part of that building, at least. So you'll never see another building built like that in Hamilton, like, that I can see because the market will not sustain the rents that you get for that, those, because the construction costs other than the land, are not different to <coughs> Auckland or Wellington, where you get five, six hundred dollars a square metre. We only get 200, 300 in the old buildings. Um, the occupancy of our car park when we bought it 10 years ago was full of, um, it was extremely, was a very high use one because of farmers. For, that was the highest performing store in the country. Um, the only store that beat it for turnover was St Luke's in Auckland. And farmers um, have dismantled it. To their, it's a bit arguable whether it was, you know. But the people that came to that store liked the fact that they had, first of all, women do not like parking underground. They will avoid it. They'd rather walk in the rain. Then they will drive underneath the car park to an underground car park. So they could turn up and they would come anywhere from Tauranga to Taupo to Haroa in a four-wheel drive, drive up there, it's a very generous car park, and they're in the daylight and they walk down to the first floor. And that's why it walked, and then they would turn up on a Thursday on a sale, spend $1,000, go home, that's it. Those people have gone from the CBD and will never ever return. And that's, <coughs> that's a commercial decision that those guys made. 
Um, we, in leasing it, we've turned it into office, which is good in one way because it brings other seven, eight hundred people in. However, we, uh, I think we've got about 80 car parks that committed to Waikato DHB. They wanted another hundred. We've moved those down to Knox Street. So we can reasonably foresee that the ability of that car park to be used for casual public parking is shrinking enormously to the point we probably um, will not be available to the public. It'll all be um, committed car parking. And Knox Street, when I, 10 years ago, you could see the top, we can see it from our office, so the top two floors were always empty, now they're not, they're parking on the roof. So those car parks are getting full of office people. So just a problem back to you guys. Um, you've made a decision on capital rating. I argued against it. Um, and I don't, you've created a problem for yourself. Thank you, Thank you Malcolm. Um, just on the parking proposal, do you support it or not? No, because um, I don't support it because I can't see, I don't see any reason why the CBD um, landowner should should pay for it. So I just You've want to clarify that because in the in your written submission to us, you support the proposal. Oh, sorry. So. Oh well, I don't mind. The, I, I'm not against it. It's the sorry, the funding. I don't the way it's funded. So, I don't. But support. you do support the proposal for two hours. Well, I've got no parking. real. I don't have a real view on the whether being free or not is beneficial. Okay. It's not what I'm looking at. Okay. What I am looking at is the fact that you once again are using businesses as okay. a way of funding things. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to um, be fair to the CBD, then you've got to eliminate the differential between residential rates. All right. Thank you. You've answered my question clearly. Thank you. Councillor Mallett. Thanks, uh, Malcolm, for your uh, uh, submission. Uh, a single story property versus a multi story property, mm. which one will generate more demand on the services of the City Council that the City Council um, I provides? Um, you. Depends which way you look at it. It's you, you're basically your infrastructure, um, actually, most of your piping and sewerage and all that is all mains on the road, and mm. we have to, the building has to connect to those mains. Um, there will be some increase in it, but I don't think it's proportionate. So a building with 14 storeys and 14 lots blocks of toilets and clearly significant, yeah, yeah hopefully it's fully tenanted, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, well, yeah, 14, yeah. 14 lots of storeys worth of employees driving into town, going away, all that sort of stuff. They, you I, you yeah, think I, they should be paying the same rate based on the, their land value versus... Um, Based on their uh, the same the, the rate based on their capital value. Depends. Yeah. Well, I I would accept there will definitely mm. be a change. I'm not mm. denying that. Mm. The question is that if you want to create a more intensive CBD, then the way you do it is you rate the land, not yeah. not the building. Yeah. Yeah. Right? that. Yeah. So once you've moved away from that, you've mm. got to if you're going to do that, mm. then you. So by the same token, if you are going to use capital value, why is the capital value of a house? Which has less rate, or it's rated separately to a commercial business, and the, and that's a very good debate, and one that I'm probably on the same side as you are on. But the, the question but, to yeah, me, but that, that's not what we're discussing today. We're talking about well, I'm um, no, no, but that's yeah. all. No, yeah. you see, want to talk about parking? Yeah, I'm saying that basically at the levels of income from parking now, most of it goes in rates. So uh, unless you address those issues, you will never have another car park building built. We, we, I mean, they're forty-five to fifty thousand. We bought ours for about twelve thousand per car park mm -hmm. ten years ago. So what are you going to do now? I mean, the council owned the one in Knox Street. It didn't work. It, it will start to work now mm -hmm. because we've got another eight hundred people and there's a hundred cars. So it will start to work now. So what are you going to do about that? Yeah. <clears throat> so and 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 once it gets back to a broader picture that you are selectively using commercial people to subsidise residential rates. Yep, you correct by a factor of two and a half or something, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I, I, if you, so therefore, if you just divided two and a half off 
$32 a week on the rates, then you'll yeah. get back to a point where people... I, I guess I'm coming from a, the global thing, which is we're trying to rejuvenate the CB, CBD, whether or not we should be, but we are. That's the, mm. And one of the proposals is to try and do that via low cost or free parking. Um, you're suggesting that a lot of the, our parking problems are coming about because of the way we rate and people can't afford well, to Well, yeah, that's, that's going to... That's going to, that's, at the moment, you're, you're basically, because we're relifing that building and we're, with KPMG Tower, we're relifing that. Westpac Trust, we've spent a lot of money on that one. Um, so to get it to relife an existing stock, once that stock has been brought back up again and, and relifed and got going on another 30 year cycle, then um, what are you going to do then? You're going to have to build new ones. New buildings or car parks, sorry? Yeah, both. Yeah. You can't have the thing, what, the complex... But when you say, what are you going to do, you're saying, I mean... Well, I'm asking you we, as a we, council... We, we, so we don't, we're not in the business of building um, commercial buildings. Yeah. That's, that's you guys. Yeah, I so, accept so, that. So I guess you'd, you'd be better off, so to just be clear, you'd, you'd say, what would the market do at that yes. stage? Yeah. And well, at know. the moment, the market the signal that you're giving is don't bother. You're, you're telling you, so if somebody went to build that complex of ours, 50,000 square metres, <laughs> if a developer came to town and said, I want to do that, you're telling them, don't bother because you'll never get your money, you'll never get a rent suitable to do it because of the, and you've contributed. Because of the capital rating? Yeah. And, and, but within the capital rating, it's the differential rating. Okay, so there's two factors there. There's a differential rating and there's, okay, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And those are very good points. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I just don't know how they, yeah. Okay, just, right. uh, we'll, uh, we'll go to Councillor Southgate, but just a reminder, that, and it is a little bit lost in the context, we, are, we have consulted on the annual plan, so uh, not just parking, but of course parking has been the main um, tenor of the submissions. So, uh, Councillor Southgate. Thank you. Just going to pursue a couple of those um, comments, the, um, the capital rating and the, and the differential. Can you explain... Um, which is the most significant? Is it the, is it the shift to capital or the additional 10% well, difference? If, if, you want, if you want a CBD to go up, then mm -hmm. you use land rating. So, all right. So, it, that's the reason that I understand count, um, base rate and your predecessors kept it. Um, because then you make more, so that you're penalising somebody for not using their land to a high value. Whereas if you use it to a high value, then it's more efficient. So, you've got an economic driver within that automatically. But not only that, it's the fact that Commercial people have been don't vote as much as residential, so over time the council has created as bookkeeping in a way that it's, it penalises commercial people over residential people. Okay, so I'm interested in um, um, you were talking about there'll be no future incentive to build car park space. We could mm. we could um, discuss how much car park space we need, but in terms of agreeing that if you're going to put a multi-storey office tower and some shop retail at the bottom and offices, you're yeah. going to have a lot of people who are going to require parking. What's your view in terms of incentivising commercial sure. developers to provide parking for the workers that come and use well, their buildings? All I've done is because it's it's rates and, and that's what I'm focused on now. So therefore all I've done is extrapolate the cost of replacing what's already there that we have now um, mm. and saying that's got a replacement value of the building side of it um, of $143 million. So in it it's about forty-five to fifty thousand dollars to build a car park in a high-rise situation, and the mm. rates on that are um, equivalent to thirty-two dollars per car per week, and we only get thirty-five dollars. Mm -hmm. So you, what, what I'm saying is that if you you are simply not, it is not economically. No developer will look at it. Mm. So I'm interested in the whole debate around that um, the short-term shopper versus the people who are coming to work like you say the health um, well, the, board they're coming that's, yeah. it's good that's a good thing that they're coming to work in the city but the you know they do bring that additional pressure so yes. so how do how do you think the best way to deal with providing sufficient space for those who work in town to to park yeah. whether it's parking on the peripheral and walking in or whatever and um, and retaining a portion of flexibility for those people who come in for short visits? That's, um, I don't really have an answer for that. I, no. haven't, actually, I haven't really, I haven't needed to, to work it out, but I can see the issue coming. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, well, I'm, I'm just I mean, when it we too. bought it, it was, when we bought Farmers, it was a, ex, 
the casual it was dominated by casual car parking hmm. and and because the um not not the um, bulk retail at Tirapa. It's only Tiara itself, the mall that's destroyed the CBD. The bulk retail wouldn't have had any or not significant impact on it. So it's was it was it dominated by casual? Just for interest, because I've never had a chance to talk to you before. But yeah. has, was it dominated by casual car parking because that was the best return for that space, or was it because that's um, to meet that need? Because I mean, there's been offices in there. Well, well you you had. Um, you had you you used to use the council you used to use your own one here then yeah so you've now shifted your staff out of that one to make it available for retail so they've moved to us and then you've got ANZ building down in Grantham Street and a couple of others so they've taken up a lot of space in Knox Street mm. um, so they all of a sudden from a surplus well, bike and after about 2010 the turnover of ours um, our car park got we had the top floor was empty. Mm. And that that's a, so the cycle now is being filled up with all day park all day parking. And so so a portion of the all day parking are, are people working yeah. taking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we just basically you end up offering it um, six dollars a day all day, which you know. And that so that and which that, wouldn't make as much money as the casual. No, person definitely not. Parking. So you've changed from a from a casual um, three four dollars an hour to six dollars a day. Mm. Mm, okay. And, and, and we, we see that as, I mean, we've adjusted to that. Yeah. And, we, and, and But you're going to miss out what I'm explaining to you, that you will not have car parks for casual people in the CBD. And the rating structure is a, an absolute um, no-go, you know. It's a killer. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'll have to do a bit more thinking about that whole incentivising of the appropriate amount of parking. So I'm really interested in that whole issue around short-term versus mm. commuter or and workers car parking. Um, all and people that work in shops are not highly paid and they will do everything they can to get cut their car parking costs down or out or walk or, and that. So I would, my gut tells me that um, if you have free parking, it'll be used by um, shop people, you know. That all okay. Get. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bunting. Cool, thank you. Look, um, and, and this is uh, very much a while you're here, can I ask you this yeah. question question, but um, that farmer's building that you're redeveloping, what's happening to the car parking there? Is it going to be exactly the same or are you converting some of it into offices or...? No, the car, um, we're not converting any of the car parks to offices. So it's is staying it? the same yes. size? there's 743 car parks here at the moment. We're sticking a atrium right through the middle of it, so oh, nice. we'll rejig it. We won't lose any, we'll just re repaint some car park lines right. and things like that. And so, but, and that, but is it going to be specifically for DHB staff? Or is well, that that, naturally, we're going to look after the, of course, the staff. Yeah. Yeah. And also, we have a lot of offices around there that people use their permanent parking as well. OK, yeah. So, so it's still going to be casual parking as well, is it? Yeah, well, by yeah. the time there will be casual park, the Waikato DHB mm. um, will have got car parks for their, for their staff. Yeah. What do you call them? Clients, oh, clients, yeah, 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 <laughs> clients. yeah. yeah. Um, for the people coming to see them, yeah, and we've, you know, that's and they will, they will rent those off oh, us, yeah, and then they'll they'll allocate them to people that turn up for appointments. Okay. okay. So when it comes to people driving in from Taharoa, mm. then I can foresee that we will not have space for them. Right. So, it, so it won't be a Wilson's car park or anything like that. Oh no, just still we'll still use Wilson's. Wilson's to run it. Oh yeah, okay. Cool. And the only thing I would like to comment is that we tried. Uh, car park recognition parking mm -hmm. and it ended up a shambles. We kicked it out. They didn't mm -hmm. they didn't know how they just their accuracy wasn't good enough. And can you flesh it out a wee bit please? That's interesting. Well we um, I mean it's a few years ago now. Mm. So they might have corrected it. But but there they said oh they they would have about a four or five percent error rate. If somebody comes in with their car and goes up and he's one of the five percent, so the seven hundred car parks, so you've got seven hundred people a day. So that's mm. how many people every day mm. are gonna be able to, they can't read their car. Okay. And if the old number plates with the black on them, they can't read them. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we, we ended was... up with all sorts of shambles. Interesting. And okay. in the end all we right. just tipped it out. That's interesting information. Thank you. Thank you, um, Malcolm, for your submission. Thank you. Okay. Right, next up we have Roger Hennebury and he is speaking on behalf of Grey Power. This is submission 339. Welcome, Roger. It's nice to see you in the chamber again. Thank you very much. Do you mind if I have a cup of 
water. Absolutely not. I've been <laughs> running down Victoria Street moving my car <laughs> because it was over two hours in your car park. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't mean that I support no. what you doing. <laughs> While you were no, doing it. <laughs> and why I brought my jacket up with me, I don't know whether you're aware, but it's to highlight abuse to elder citizens this um, week. And Maggie Barry's proportioning $40 million into uh, uh, senior abuse. It is quite rife and, and it is part of our, 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 shall we say, our inheritance. No, and that was the laugh actually. She said it was, uh, this week was uh, senior abuse week. Well, of course it isn't, it's highlighting the abuse. Yeah. We're not gonna go out and abuse people, I hope. <laughs> Although I feel like it today, but tell you what, I'm, I've, I've, I've slowed down a little bit. So if you don't mind, I'd like to just make a statement that this is actually, well, I heard a lot of people today who sort of purport to, to represent groups and possibly it's their own opinion. This is actually was collated by our uh, committee and three morning teas on Monday mornings with our people that come in asking for their feedback. So this is, I feel, as a genuine sort of grey power submission. Okay, um, well, here we go. Well, we don't support what you're proposing, the free car parking. And the evidence before the, uh, before nine and after three, I don't think substantiates going any further. We may support a free trial with different hours and a buy-in from those people. And the people I'm talking about is the shopkeepers because just free parking won't work. I've been on council a long time. I actually stood for mayor and my slogan was the city was a dead duck, if you remember, and that's nine years ago and I don't think it's really changed. And before I came here, I walked up and down Victoria Street to prove a point. The shops are empty. I've just ran down Victoria Street now from, great, from Age Concerns Centre. Most of the shops are empty. Giving free park, I looked along the Victoria Street again for your own bit. Uh, the parks were full, so I don't know where the people were. So I don't feel that free parking will work. Free parking came about because of the base, I think. People perceived it to be free. Of course it's not. The retailers there pay for that and pay for those parks. So indirectly, it's paid for by the businesses. How should we fund it? Well, there's a bid rate out there that the council already put in place for economic development which has become a white elephant and a bureaucratic nightmare in my view. If you really want to do a trial, use some of that money. And let's come up and give us the figures, the rate pairs, the figures, the benefit this city's getting on that trial. Because I don't think you can just open the door and say free parking's gonna work. It has to work with some other criteria. And we outlined, as they do in Europe, shops stay open later in the evening. Mm. And they actually catch people going home who say I must drop in and do this or do that, and I've got my weekend free sometimes. So we suggest that you fund it through that way. Other proposals in your annual plan, uh, community leases is a hot potato at the moment. And Grey Power is affected by this community lease. We've been there 26 years and uh, we're having, are going to have some radical changes if you're not aware and we don't agree with those. Targeted rates in the new suburbs, we agree with targeted rates in the new suburbs. We've got the uh, mass immig immigration and um, people wandering from Auckland because the prices are too high, coming down, investing the money in quality houses down here at quarter of the price. And for that uh, pleasure, the city council and the ratepayers of this city have to provide all the infrastructure for those new developments and for their pleasure. We are suggesting that for their pleasure, should, they should pay for it and we shouldn't. Council should put hold on any further projects that are going to cost money. Uh, we are alarmed at what the rate was proposed or was proposing that we needed a 12% raise rate to put the financial figures in place. I've looked at your annual plan and I think um, you've got two sets of figures there. We're two million in surplus or we're 12 million in debt. Um, I, I would like to ask, and uh, maybe you councillors could tell me what's your view on that one, maybe if I have time. Um, where do I live, it said. I, d I didn't know whether that was appropriate. Uh, can you tell us your age group? And it finishes at 64. Does that mean anybody over 64 doesn't have a view? Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm here on grey power, and I'm, I'm joking aside now, really what's going on is stressing out a lot of our members. They're elderly, they're asset rich. Some of them have been here 50 years and maybe bought a little house around the lake. Uh, why should they move? Why should they have to move when the rates are so high? And then you're going to put onto them something like somewhere between 30 and 50, maybe $60 extra for free parking. I brought this up with Maggie Berry, actually, who's our Minister for Seniors. And, and she, she put it this way, that they're very concerned with stress and abuse. And I've put it to great power that if this abuse continues in the way of rate hikes unacceptable for our members, we should go to the High Court and get a ruling on whether this is actually abuse by stealth. Because the stress you guys put on to my members with talk of a 12% increase or a 60% for free parking and all the other cost increases these people can't afford because the pensions simply can't pay. Just under 50% of superannuants, Grey Power members, rely solely on the super. I'm getting it now, guys. You are not going to be far behind. You try and live on the super. Not everybody's been as fortunate as me. Not everybody. Or as fortunate as yourself. Hard-working New Zealanders who've had families, been in a rental house all their lives, brought up three or four kids. When they retire, they don't have a nest egg. And they thought that the super would pay the way. Okay, I know you can live cheaper in Vietnam or somewhere, but I don't think that's what they want. I think they want to live here in comfort, or reasonable comfort. The other thing is, while I've got time, Maggie Barry has talked about age-friendly cities. And we are a pilot city. I've had a conversation with her where this council does not have anything in its policy regarding elder housing, warmth housing, cheap available housing, at all in their age-friendly city policy. I've suggested to her, unless that changes, the bureaucrats should wipe Hamilton off an age-friendly city. We do not simply, and, and we are not, an age-friendly city. You prove that by selling the pension of flats. You've proved that by putting up rates that they can't afford. You've proved that by this policy of free parking in the CBD at a cost to some of them up to $80. And because I live personally now in a reasonable house, my rates for free parking is going to be probably $80 plus. That's terrible. That is terrible. I think you need to have a range, and I, I admired the young fellow that was in earlier, you need a range of policies to fix it. I don't believe free parking will fix it. Let me put it another way. Hamilton residents, ratepayers, pay nearly $8 million towards the buses targeted rate already that's costing $27 million to run the buses, a third paid by the government, which is a lot more because the fare box collection doesn't even come to the third. We have huge subsidy in passenger transport. I felt very uncomfortable for Bill McMaster this morning at the Regional Council trying to defend free parking in the city well, it would probably knock 10 to 15% off the buses, which is already subsidized. He was put in an incivic position of having to defend our, our council's policy of free parking. How am I going for time, Madam Chair? You're doing fine. There's been no dinging of a bell. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there was an old chestnut when I was on council and that there was no parks. There's lots of parks. There is lots of parks. The argument was you couldn't park outside the shop where you wanted to go. We already pay a rate, a bid rate, we pay a, a, a city rate. If this is going to benefit economic development, the people that should be targeted is the businesses, not the residential people of this city, in my view. And as I said, they've already been unfairly taxed with the bid rate. So if you're going to run a pilot, take it out the bid rate. Give us some figures that their economic development's just gone out the window because of free parking, and then you get the buy-in by the rate payers. But at the moment, they just see it as another tax. Questions, please. Thank you. All right, questions, Councillor Mallet. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Angela. Thank you very much, Roger. Uh, and you um, went a bit wider than just parking onto the annual plan, which is good, thank you. But on, on our question three, it says, yes. does... Yeah, no, that's good. Okay. Yep, thank you. No, I'm not, I'm not criticising yeah. you. Thank you. Um, 
you talked about early on, and you may or may not remember this, benefit for the city, and, I, and it was in the context of the um, parking Park issue. Free, what we have at the moment. Yeah. yeah. How, how do you define benefit, or what did you mean when you said benefit of the city for the city? Anecdotally, talking to shopkeepers, I said, has your turnover gone up? So just to be clear, so you're saying CBD, so you're talking anecdotally talking about, so when you said um, benefit for the city, you were talking about the CBD. CBD, okay, sorry, that's sorry, where yeah, the okay. rate is going to apply for okay. the free parking yeah, in that right. area of free parking, yeah. Look, anecdotally, people I've spoken to, I've said, well, what was the benefit of between nine, before nine? Zero. Absolute zero. You can fire a gun at 10 o'clock anywhere in this CBD and you won't hit anybody. So it wasn't there. That was actually there, in my view, and, and you may say I'm cynical and may, you may not like it, is for the people who had had too much to drink the night before and left the cars in town, didn't get a parking ticket. Uh, and that's quite true. The only people who benefited were those. And then after three o'clock, give me your evidence. Unless you've got your shopkeepers staying open after that time, there's no benefit whatsoever. If it's working with a, a rift of other plans, I think it could work. I think it needs a bit more uh, trial and, uh, and trial so that you can see where the benefits are and give us some evidence. So Roger, so Roger are you saying you're, you're supportive of singling out the CBD to help it to improve it over other parts of the city? No, I'm, all I'm saying to you is I'm responding to your annual yep. plan. Okay. And the question was, and because I represent Grey Power, we put it to Grey Power and this is their their submission, not me personally, I have yeah, some yeah, personal yeah, views, yeah, yeah. That the overall answer was no. They, the, our people did not feel they should subsidise. But I put it to them that maybe if it did work in conjunction with other things, maybe a proportion, not the full 1.4 million, and the funding shouldn't be coming from our rate payers, as I call them, it should come out of the bid rate, which is already rated on behalf okay. of the business to give them economic development. Thanks, Roger. And one other question, um, and this is, the, I think you are now commentating, when you said this, you were commentating on the whole uh, 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 annual plan. Yes. You said Holt projects. Yes. Um, that we got, okay. Well, which, then you've, you've, can you be you've, more specific? Which, one, which ones well, are you we, talking about? Well, we've got a, a, a really fantastic view of a zoo plan here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's going to cost an awful lot of money. Now, it's nice to plan ahead, mm. but I've learnt through being on council for that many years now that... Once you put a plan into place, some take traction because there's buy-in. Yep. I like the zoo personally, but I see that right now it's not the right thing to be doing. If we are $12 million short, we should be concentrating on putting that right, not planning to spend more money, frankly. Okay. So, Our so oldies cannot get used to not living within budgets. Okay, and so, so maybe offline you could um, give us a list of the projects that you, your, yeah. your people have some concern about. Well, what I will do then, uh, Mr. Um, Councillor, sorry, is that I would have to ask my people, because I have yeah, personal yeah. views yeah. and I'm here representing great yep. power, and yep. I think that's important to tell you. All right. Um, I guess the other thing that I, you haven't asked me about, and that is our lease. Yeah, I was going to ask that. You, oh, sorry. No, that's okay. I, I won't jump the queue. Now, about else. your lease. <laughs> <laughs> no, Lee, Angela can have that the one. The chair always likes Thank to go. Thank you, Roger. It's good to, do you want me to? Okay. So I was interested in that because, um, Roger, you said around radical changes of your tenancy. Mm. So can you just let us know what that is? Well, what's actually happened is there's been a proposal for tenancy gone out to, to the major tenants and also advertised in your local magazine for somebody to be a lead tenant in the Age Concern building that we put money into and we have a stake in, to take it over and be the major leasehold. And that would involve then them subleasing to us. Now, what will happen if that happens is they have to control the full footprint. The fo full footprint involves security. It involves all the amenities that are there, uh, upkeep, et cetera, et cetera. At the moment, we're very lucky, and, and some may not agree with this, but we do get subsidised through the council. Under this other scheme, we may be hit with a lot larger rents. Simply, uh, we, we pay very little rent, to be honest with you, and we're very grateful. But when we uh, rent the big hall, when Winston Peters comes or the Prime Minister, we're only paying $20 an hour for that hall. And that only covers a very small proportion. But if it has a major tenant, we could be paying $200 an hour, $300 an hour. I'm wondering where the community benefit comes in, because you have to account for some community benefit. 
I think the age concern centre down there is if I'd as I actually emailed you all to come and have a look. It's the most used building I've ever seen. I pay $6 every morning to park somewhere out on the street. If it was free, I wouldn't. But I, <laughs> um, I pay money to, to park because I can't park anywhere near the age concern centre myself. And the problem that I have is, you see, that certain groups you subsidise, and you may not know it, under the community plan, you're subsidising some people to go there for free as community outcomes. We have a large Chinese content there that just mass in there and don't pay anything. We have a, a very large Zumba group that pay two or three dollars for the Zumba meeting, but that goes to somewhere else because the person running it now is running it possibly as a business. Okay, can I, um, somehow that's escaped my radar, so I'll um, certainly get staff to come back and you give us some You need to talk to Andy Mannering, who, who I'm dealing yeah. with. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, so just a follow-up question then. Um, how long have Grey Power been tenants in the building? 26 years. 26 years. So are you the longest tenant, do you know? Age concerns say that we're there about the same time. Okay. But we actually, in, in, a, in an Evans government uh, council, uh, we actually uh, had, had a fund of about $60,000, which was put into building that building. And as per usual, uh, it wasn't enough to keep it running, so the council took it over. Uh, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, so we're not complaining about it, the cost, we're just no. complaining about now okay. that I'm hoping a lead tenant doesn't come in there and, and ruin it because okay. it's your best building in and town. Uh, Roger, has Grey Power, or if you know age concern, uh, started the process of becoming that lead tenant? I don't know what the process is. We'll okay, well, that I out. may not be, I might be speaking out of town here, so, t t no. town, so take it as okay. it is. I feel that maybe Age Concern would apply to be the lead tenant. Okay. But Age Concern didn't realise the costs involved. Okay. They didn't realise they were going to have to take over the whole running of the building. At the moment, council gives 35000 to Age Concern, plus half a salary for running the front office, where the council used to have two members there. So they're now running the front office. Okay. All so right. all that would go. Okay. Well, I've certainly captured that on my list for Thank questions you. and to look into. Um, Councillor Bunting. Thank you. Yeah. I, I might have misheard you, Roger, but you were talking about late night shopping. Yes. Uh, extending shopping hours. Yes. Can you uh, can we drill down to that place? That really fascinates okay, me. Okay. Well, I know you know about the the hot weather in Europe and they have siestas in the middle of the day, but not everybody does. <laughs> oh, have yeah. you been to one of these, mate? <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm suggesting is. I'm told your statistics, statistics say there's 10 to 15,000 people work in the city. If only 5% of those people on the way home decided to pop in and do some shopping after five, because the shops are still open, mm. then the free parking and everything else might contribute. But the shops have to have a campaign to say we're going to do a trial. I'm not going to say it's going to work, but I think it would work in conjunction with your parking, right. paid for out of the bid rate. And so if you did only four hours, the loss of income would be covered by your bid rate. So you're suggesting that shops sh could stay open until, say, when? Well, uh, in the old days, I don't know whether you remember this, but Garden Place was a car park, and you're all going, oh, gosh. Uh, the shops used to stay up until 9 o'clock on a Friday, and you couldn't move up and down Victoria Street. I'm suggesting probably 7.30 would be late enough to to get some traction, because between right. 5 and 7.30, somebody might have a coffee, decide not to cook tonight, nip into farmers, and they do the shopping and may not come on the weekend. Totally agree with you. Um, I'd like to see it at midnight myself, but what can we do as a council to... to um well, you know, you've got the, the... I think a lot of them are submitting against this, but I think you used to have a, a business round table, as I call it. I think it may have another name, but... Mm. Uh, I would be as council proactive and have a meeting with them and, and suggest, look, we'll do this if you do that. Right. You okay. know, it's a quid pro quo and, and there could be some benefit. You see, I, I'm very sceptical. I've had a lot of time on my hands the last three years, as you know, and I've gone grey and I've done a Richard Preble. I've been thinking. <laughs> and I've been thinking that the city centre hasn't got any better in the last nine years. So, you, so if you want to try something new, let's be innovative. You know, I mean, everybody says free parking, but I don't think that's just going to wash. I think it has to have buy-in with the camps, with the the shops, and let's alter a perception of the city centre. I'm loving the fact you're coming with ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Henry. Oh, 
Fabulous. Thank you so much, Roger. Um, it's, it's interesting we're sitting on opposite sides this time. <laughs> no, we're not on opposite sides. <laughs> well, not op I mean, you know, different. <laughs> yeah, I know. Different sides understand. of the table. Yeah, different sides of the table. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. Now, um, just uh, I just have to lead into my, my question with a couple of um, statements here, but um, so it, you, it, uh, it'll be understood. And it's, it's overseas, p people work just as hard as in New Zealand, yeah. but they, they don't always have the, the, the luxury to live in big houses like we do. Mm. We, we do live in, in paradise here, and we do live in big houses, and, and we, we, we want to live till we die or whatever, go to, or to a retirement home <laughs> in this, these big houses. Um, well, um, and also, um, the other thing is, from overseas experience, when older people live with younger people, they live um, more secure, more have more social interaction, and uh, th there's more positive outcomes. Now, what I'm getting at is, is um, oh, the other thing is, then there's other people that look for reasonable rents. So putting all that together, have, have Grey Power ever, or the Grey Power members ever thought about if they rented out one of their rooms in their houses to somebody who's looking for a reasonable rent, that they actually could, just one room at $150 a week, make $7,800 a year. That is half of the, um, or uh, uh, I don't know exactly. So, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, it, Councillor it, Henry. It's just your question's yeah. not even relative to the annual plan or the submission. Oh. So it's but paying for rates and everything. Well, isn't it? No, I. Look, uh, can I answer that? The biggest. <laughs> you can try. The, 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 the biggest just cause of death is dying, of course. <laughs> um, so you're right there. <laughs> That's only recently, yes, yes. I think it's been proved recently. <laughs> it's a new concept. Yeah. Um, I, I hear what you're saying, but I mean, when a superannuant starts earning money and declares it, the inland revenue get very aggressive, and it takes pretty much most of that sort of money you're talking about really? away. Yes, it does. Wow. Uh, the other thing is, most of the people that come to our meetings are either in rental okay. or very poor circumstances. We do have a lot of wealthy Grey Power members. Uh, well, I say a lot. We have wealthy Grey Power members. We do have another sector who are considered wealthy because the properties are probably a million plus, but they've actually not got anything in the bank. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in the bank. And you, some here would say, well, move out and buy a home unit. But if they've been in there 50 years and they've lived all their lives there, why should they? Why should they? So I know you're going to say there's rebates and you can put rates on, on hold and, and all the rest, but the psyche of our old people isn't for that. And I don't think you people around the corner would want your mother to do that or your father. It's just not in the New Zealand culture. I find the New Zealand culture fantastic here, really caring, but I think it's starting to dwindle. Mm. Right, thank thank you. you. Last question, Councillor Kesson. Thank you. I actually plan to live until I die too. So, um, <laughs> look, um, Grey Power members in Hamilton, ha what are the numbers? We actually were very fortunate. We, we've um, got 1,640 paid up numbers, which is just over 2,100, somewhere around that members. And we're the first time in history that we got nearly nine tenths of them paid up by May. It's usually <laughs> December. Okay. Yeah. Um, I see you had some papers there and uh, you were saying uh, with your meetings, did you have some sort of straw poll or, or whatever about this parking proposal well, with members? What we did was um, we have a coffee, coffee morning and you're all welcome to come along because we passed as our AGM just this week. I came back from Palmerston North, which was a national AGM, that you can be members under 50. So I think you all qualify. Just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and look, um, it, it, what we did was we had a coffee morning and I wasn't present, but some of my, my, my deputy and another person that runs it asked them questions because instead of me coming here because I've got the knowledge of how this works, instead of me coming here and giving you my idea, we decided this time to ask them what things that influence them. And you might see there's one of the things here is they said sell Claudelands. So I said, really, do you understand what that means? 
Well, yes, they did, because they realized we still have to pay for it, but we didn't have to pay for the other two or three million dollars of running it, so we're that much better off even if you sold it for a dollar. You know, if you sold it for a dollar, but who the hell would buy it for a dollar? It's, 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 it's a bit about the dead duck. It's a great asset. I like it, but it's the paying for it. I like the rugby stadium. It's the paying for it. I love the parks. We have 147 parks in Hamilton, but it's paying for them. You know, we, we all have that dream. <laughs> Labour Minister Phil Twyford came and spoke to us about his dream uh, at the AGM, but he couldn't, ha he couldn't dream up how we we're going to pay for it. Um, you know, and we, we've had uh, Maggie Berry, who was very, very good and realises there's a hell of a lot of age abuse, and this week is age abuse week, and, uh, well, not to do it, just to draw your attention to it. And, and I think that I had a lady, I've got a lady, 80, 99, who's there, and I have some people that come to me and say, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rates without this increase. All right, so you, right. Could, safely, you could safely say the um, 1,640 paid-up members you have, a majority of them would be against the proposal? No, I didn't say that. What I did say was on Monday mornings we have meetings where up to 26, 40 people come, mm. and that was the way we were able to straw poll it. I speak on their behalf, by the way, so... Uh, I would like to think that if I asked them for support, I would get support. Okay, thank you very much, Roger. Um, committee, we are going to take a break. We've been sitting for a really long time. I know we're over time, but we're not, we, we've got a, a good hour in front of us still, at least. So we're going to stop for lunch. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, bye. And uh, we'll be back, well, 35 minutes, so we'll be back at 2.